All right. Okay. So I'm just gonna point out first, you know, if you don't know where to find me, you know, this is how you can find me. My office phone number is 916-484-8250. If you cannot uh, talk to me over the phone, um, you can always leave a message. Uh, the message, you know, in the good old days, you used to require me to call in to collect, but these days, you know, they send it to me as an MP3 file through email, so, you know, I always get to it. Uh, my room is exactly number three. Um, you just go to the door where there are a lot of stickers, Star Wars, you know, stickers, that's the room. You cannot miss it. <laughs> you cannot miss it. My office hours are Monday through Friday, you know, every single day from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. If you need to arrange to talk to me at a different time, just let me know and we can do it that way. Um, so this is not very important. Uh, class content is delivered by video clips, reading material, interactive activities. So for the most part, you know, not really important. Um, okay, so etiquette, etiquette policy. Um, so I don't like any content in, you know, in terms of um, communication. Okay, so no content that can that creates a hostile environment or, or can reasonably lead to interpretations of harassment or discrimination. So you know, so we, we keep all that material out of the classroom and out of any media that we deal with in this class. So no, so these are just examples. It's not an exclusive list of stuff that I do not want to be in class. Uh, Cyberbullying is definitely a no-no as well, okay? No spamming, and um, content that can be interpreted offensive is also not going to be tolerated in class or in any content that we you know, basically expose to other classmates. Okay, first day of class, we're well beyond that, not a problem. <coughs> accommodations, if you think that you might need special accommodations, uh, make sure you contact the DSPS office uh, and they can help arrange uh, resources for people who need uh, special accommodations. Um, so let me continue. Excessive absences, <coughs> 6% is the, is the magic number, which turns out to be three classes if a class meets three times a week. Now for this class, because we only meet once a week, it means you're missing classes twice can be considered excessive. All right, moving right along. Um, excuses, um, the only excuses that are, the only absences that are excused are the sickness of the student, but I understand a lot of times, you know, we have kids who are sick and we have to stay home, we have other issues that might you know, prevent us from coming to class. So, you know, at my discretion, you know, some of those may be excused as well. Uh, late policy, you know, we have, you know, changed the late policy quite a bit in this class, you know, by me moving the deadline. <laughs> so no one is late, we, we'll just move the deadline. Okay, academic dishonesty, uh, this is, you know, classified as, um, it occurs when a student attempts to show a possess show possession of a level of competency knowledge or skill beyond the level of the student or some other student. So this is why we don't want to copy stuff, okay? You know, we want to originate the material, and if it doesn't work, you know, let me know and I can help you, you know, understand the material or help you work it out, okay? But the idea is not to copy it from somebody else. Now, sometimes, you know, I would give you my code, right? You know, like last time, I gave, I gave you guys my code, but I explained it, okay? So, and I did say that, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, even though the code is available to you, that you guys will not just copy and paste it, okay? You can use it as a reference, okay? Let me check out what how Tech did a particular thing and learn from it and then make it your own, okay? Write your own code, but you can use this, a, a similar technique. Um, academic integrity uh, is basically a positive way to look at the same thing. So the grade of a particular assessment of a particular student reflects the academic performance of the student and only of the student who turned in the assessment work at the approvals, approved time of the assessment, you know, in, the whole, in the case of homework, you know, by due date and so on and so forth, following all the rules of the assessment and using only the resources that are permitted by the instructor. 
So it doesn't re really apply that much to this class, okay? It applies to many of my other classes because we do have exams in those other classes. This class doesn't have any exams. It's project-based. Okay, consequences, student rights and responsibilities, and then we have classroom behavior expectations. So um, somewhere behind the projection screen, yeah, there we, there we go. It says right there, no food, no drinks, no phone, and no kids. Now, I have no idea why you know, they put kids on that list. <coughs> I'm guessing, you know, at one point of time, somebody, you know, brought in, you know, younger, you know, children who were, one, not in the class, and two, was disturbing or distracting to the entire class. So in that case, I have to add some more items. Pets. I have had one student who brought in a, uh, a dog, and it's not a working dog, this is like just a pet. And the dog was um, very distracting in class. <coughs> First of all, the dog pants like no tomorrow. It's like, <laughs> like that the whole time. And then when he's bored, it would turn around and lick students who are sitting <laughs> in the back. Now, no aggression whatsoever. Lovely dog, you know, super friendly, but it was super distracting as well. So I had to tell the student, okay, you cannot bring the dog in the classroom because it's distracting the rest of the class. So, um, we also don't want anything that is disruptive. Um, and disruption comes in many forms. You know, chatting is one, it is the most common way of distracting other people. And a lot of times it is not intentional. A lot of times it's really just someone asking the person who's next to that person and go like, Okay, I didn't quite catch what Tex said. Could you tell me what he said? Okay, and that's legitimate stuff, right? But it still distracts the other students as well as other students, you know, many other students around who could, who could hear the conversation. So instead of asking the student next to, you know, you know instead of asking another student, it might be better just to ask me. Just raise your hand and say, okay, Tex, I didn't quite get what you said. Could you just repeat what you said? Okay, so that's perfectly okay. Just ask me. Um, interrupting in class. So just, you know, saying something while I'm teaching the class, you know, um, is, is interrupting. On the other hand, if I say, okay, do you guys have any questions or do you have any points to make? Or, you know, just out of nowhere, okay? If you say that I got something to say, raise your hand, okay? I have not been known not to let people say something in class. I just need to make sure that I finish my sentence first and go like, okay, go ahead. What do you have? To, tell me what you think. Okay, it's just a matter of protocol. Uh, mobile devices. I just you know silence mine. Okay, so along with all those things, you know there are a few things that are not on the list that are also can be considered distracting. Um, Walking in front of other people, you know, in, in when the class is in session, can be distracting. Okay, so you know it might be better to sit down or you know just to stay close to your seat. So that would be great. Okay. Um, let's see here. These do not apply because we don't have any classes before nor after this particular class, so it's all it's okay. Uh, this one we just experienced. Walking in late, you know, can distract the whole class, especially when the class closes with a bang. We just heard that. <laughs> so next time, you know, just kind of buffer the closing of the door, just kind of ease the close, you know, so that it doesn't slam. But yep. Mm -hmm. You complained to the janitor that they could take that thing on the top, so that's Yeah, it. For some reason, that dampener doesn't work anymore. You know, this thing here. Some days it works. Huh? It doesn't. Sorry? Some days it works, other days it doesn't. It may be a temperature thing. It could be uh, it's losing its viscosity. Maybe it, it has some kind of fluid inside and it's not, you know, the viscosity has changed. I'm pretty sure we can put in an order to fix it and it's not going to be happening anymore. A lot of these buildings will be torn down. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of this semester, it's all going to be torn down. So any surface request will just be, oh, let's put it under the pile. <laughs> Unless it's you know, life threatening or you know, 
safety concern that you know they probably will do it, but you know if the door is just you know shutting a little bit too loudly, I don't think they're going to pay attention to that. Um, all right. So the key is you know uh, distracting behavior. You know really is not okay in this class. Okay. You know I don't. And a lot of times you know I will let people know that something is distracting, and you know it's you know it has to stop. Is that okay? Okay. Well, that's that's okay. You know, I'm not questioning intent. I'm only observing the outcome. I'm, I do not judge people, you know, with the intention. You know, I do not judge people by the nature because I'm not a mind reader. I cannot tell. But I can only observe, you know, what is going on, and I can hear when people are chatting. I can I, even if I can hear people chatting, that means the rest of the class can as well, because I'm my hearing is going. <laughs> okay, a lot of times I cannot hear properly, so if I can hear something, the rest of the class certainly can hear that too. Alrighty, so any questions? So Mason, do you want to choose your workstation? Okay, let me ask that question again. Do you want to choose your space? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't need space. Other people need their space, so you are going to choose yours and stay within that perimeter. Uh, Would that be okay? Uh, my space is uh, this computer. Okay, sounds good to me. Okay, All right. It's okay, I understand if you have a back pain, you want to stand up, you know, that's okay. So, so is Okay. Well, that's okay. You're not, you know, as long as you know the rest of the class is okay and it's not getting distracted, we're good. Okay. Right. Okay. So today's the main topic is going to be something that we have not really talked about. We kind of start to talk about it a little bit last time, but we didn't quite get into it. So the whole topic is about sessions, okay? So now the question is, okay, what exactly is a session? So what I want to do is I'm going to show you the cookies, and I cannot remember how to get to the cookies. There's a search feature somewhere so I can find the features. Yep, there you go. Find you. That's not it. Okay, where is that? I think it's under preferences. And there's a find, supposedly there's a find under preferences to display cookies. Could be security, privacy. There we go. Okay, so remove individual cookies. And many of you probably have looked at this list. How many people have not? Examine the list of all the cookies that your computer has stolen. Sure, clean it every day, right? You clean it up, okay? Yeah, I don't, I don't clean it unless I have to, but occasionally on certain websites, you can get stuck, where you know you can't go forward and you cannot go backward either. Like it, it doesn't let you log in. Every attempt to log in is kind of it, it will kick you out. So sometimes it has to do with you know whatever cookie is stored on your computer is either outdated. Or they have a version issue, like the cookie that is given to you is from the older version of the script, and the new version doesn't like the old the cookie that was generated by the old script, or something along that line. So you have to delete something. Okay. So I'm gonna yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you were uh, streaming. Like you said, you should remind you of that sometimes. Absolutely. So let's see. It is in fact streaming, and the audio is uh, good as well. There we go. So we are good. Um, Amanda may be watching right now because uh, she told me that she was sick, so she couldn't come to class. So she might be actually watching the stream as we as, as we go. Yep. Hi Amanda. Hi Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> uh, about the website, did they ask you, or do you want us to remember your password? 
Mm-hmm. No, the cookies. Okay, the passwords are not stored as cookies. So when you sign into a website and you want to store the password, the password is actually stored in the folder of the browser, which is very, very insecure. <laughs> it is encrypted in a way, but the encryption is very weak. So that means, you know, if you try to, so let's say you go to, um, okay, I'm gonna go, go to a place where I definitely don't want to store my passwords. Okay, so you go to Wells Fargo, you type in the name, okay. Actually, yeah, that's how my bank does that. <laughs> they store my password. So, and when I, when I do this, um, well, this browser did not ask me you know, to type in, to, to remember the, my password. I think it might ask only if I log in successfully. I totally use a fake name and a fake password, by the way. <laughs> Rich guy 1024 is not my, my name. Yep. Mm -hmm. You have to put in a real password and then it will save. And then it will prompt you for saving? Yeah. yeah. Save so don't, yeah, do not, I, I personally would not let the browser save the password because the password is saved on the client side which is on your computer. Yep, go ahead. Um, this might be a bit too esoteric, so forgive me and stop me if it is, but um, if you want to uh, be able to store your passwords because you forget them or something, and you don't want to do it on paper for some reason, you can always get a password manager to take uh, the storage of your password and the, it's the security there with it into your own hands. Okay, so that depends on you know where your pad, where your keychain is. So sometimes you know, those apps are called keychains, you know, where you can store passwords. Yeah. Um, okay, let, let 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 me hear what Thomas has to say. Yeah, go ahead. What if, what if the password manager is attached? Exactly. So it's just if a little you, bit more secure though than like right than now, the alternative. But the, but there is a way to get around it. Yeah. Okay. So the way to get around this is to use a really old cell phone that you don't use anymore, just kind of laying around because it's too old, the battery life is not good, and so on and so forth. Um, take the SIM card out, okay? And make sure it doesn't hook up to the Wi-Fi, okay? Ho hook up to Wi-Fi first, install the password manager, and then, you know, and then cut off the Wi-Fi. So make sure your device is not getting onto the internet, it's not going to any network of any kind, and then you can use it to store your password. Technically, paper is the most secure, of course. Though. Yes, which is surprising because a lot of people say, well, what if I lose my little booklet of passwords? And don't. <laughs> well, the chances of you losing that is less than your device getting hacked so that people can get your passwords. Yeah. Yep. Could, could you just use a dumb phone? A dumb device, not a dumb phone. We want no. something that has no access to anything so that people cannot hack it. Um, so I would say, you know, just a little booklet, you know, is helpful. Now, if you want extra, uh, want just, just that one extra layer of protection, when you write down your password, write it down backwards, okay? Or some, in some way that only you know how to read, okay? So now somebody picks up your, your little booklet of password and go like, oh, I can now get to your PayPal and pay me, you know, a lot of money. They would try to sign in, but unless they know how to read the password, which can be backwards, can be alternating, like you know, one, three, five, seven, and then back to two, four, six, eight, okay? That person cannot sign in. You could write it in a triptych cipher. <laughs> you can have your own cipher, exactly. Yeah. You can have your own physical cipher. Yep, go ahead. Uh, Yep, exactly. Or you can have a suffix, you know, of, of your password that you always type in, but you do not write it on paper. So when you type the password, you always know. Okay, I know there's always a suffix of, you know, ASDF. Okay, but you don't write ASDF, you know, on the paper. So people who pick up your password would just you know, be typing in the password, but without the ASDF. Yep. The last pass will generate some crazy password. That means you have to look that up every single time. <laughs> I'm not really sure I like that idea. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the, enc the encryptions I'm familiar with and using PHP, uh, I use uh, MD5 and uh, SHA1. Okay. To, uh, Technically, they, those are not encryption. They are called hash functions. We'll talk about that in today's class too. Yep, go ahead. I forgot. <laughs> okay, that's all right. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll move on when you remember, let me know.
Okay, not a problem. So I'm going to stay on this page, you know, because I want to look at your know, individual cookies. And today's topic is sessions. Okay, you know, how do we use a PHP session? So what we'll do is what I'm going to do is to write very simple scripts to illustrate the concept of sessions. So I'm going to go to my account on arccis.net. <clears throat> And by the way, everything that we do with passwords and whatnot, you know, in this class, just consider those, you know, little toy experiments, okay? In other words, you know, never use your actual and real password when you're testing your code in this class. Use something that's totally fake, okay? Because the content on this particular server is not secure, okay? You know, because I'm too cheap to pay for a real SSL certificate. <laughs> so, so it's not actually encrypted. And two, you know, um, you know, even though the content on this website is not secure, if somebody gets a hold of your password, that can be very bad. So do not use anything close to your actual password. Just, just do something that's you know easy, like one, two, three, four, okay? Because if that password gets stolen, hey, no big deal. Nobody can actually use it for anything other than, oh, I can now mess up your know, Thomas' you know, website and it totally mess up his database. Okay, it's. I, I, on one hand, you know, I, I think this class is important, but at the same time, you know, to a hacker, to somebody, somebody who's want to make money, I'm sorry, your projects are not that important <laughs> because it's not worth money. You know, they can they, they can try to hold you ransom and go like, Thomas, I got your project, I just got it all encrypted. If you want it back, you know, pay me three hundred bucks. Thomas says, I'll take the class again. <laughs> For 300 bucks, I'll take the class again. Right? Makes sense? Yep, okay. Sorry, I'm just picking on you today. All right, so we'll go write a program. I'm just going to call this session1.php. And it is not really that much of a big deal. Now, the first thing is if you're using sessions, okay? Do not start the whole script with HTML, the tag HTML. So you want to start with the script itself. Okay, you want to start with PHP script as the beginning. So do not put any actual HTML code ahead of the script. Always start the script itself. And the first thing you do is to say session start. The reason why we have to do it this way is because when you type in HTML, the tag HTML, H, uh, PHP understands that is actual HTML code, and it will start the actual content of the uh, uh, HTML document. What needs to be done is um, session start will generate cookies. Okay. In other words, the server will now try to pass a cookie to the client, which is my browser, and say, hey, browser, store this particular cookie so that we can identify the session. Okay, So this is really important. So we'll put session start here, and I'm going to stop the other tags at this point because I want to use a tool that can really help us understand what is going on when we play with uh, sessions in PHP. So I'm closing all of the other tabs because I don't want any interference from those other tabs. And we switch back to this code here. And after this, you can do anything you want. Okay, so after this, you can say print the usual stuff, you know, HTML, add, close of head, body, and you know, put the rest of the code here, okay? And then the last one is print close body, okay? And also close HTML, okay? This is an empty document. Doesn't do a single thing, does it? Has no content, doesn't do anything. But it does have session start, okay? So we'll find out what this program is gonna do. So we'll call this program. And before we execute this script, I'm going to go to that page that I was mentioning a little bit earlier. So we go to preferences. If this is Firefox, you go to preferences, and then you go to privacy, and then you go to remove individual cookies. And over here, you know, we can see all of the cookies from other websites. 
So I'm going to type in ARC CIS here, and we can see that you know it has one particular. Um, oh, this is not from ARCCIS.net. It is the content that has the mentioning of ARCCIS.net, but the site is not. Okay. So at this point, I have not set up any cookies from ARCCIS.net. Okay. So we'll go ahead and open a new tab. And we go to AIC, ARCCIS.net and enter my name, um, CISW410 and session1.php. Press the enter key. So it looks like nothing happened. <clears throat> when nothing is shown on screen, you know, it is always a good idea to look at a page source just to make sure that, nope, we're good, you know, everything is here. It's just that. Uh, you know, there's no content to be displayed. Okay, and anything that is appearing in red means you know you, you need some attention. Start tag scene without seeing a doc type first, so it's you know it's convention you know that is is missing. But as far as what we're talking about today, it's okay. Okay, it's okay not to have that. <clears throat> but then I go back to here, and you can see right here, um, we are now having a cookie. Okay, see the second item. So when I click on this item here, it says you know ARCCIS.net, and the name of the cookie is PHP session ID. Okay, it says ID, but it, it really means session ID. Okay. So we can examine this session cookie a little bit more. Okay, I cannot really you know, pull this one up. <clears throat> so right here it says the name is PHP says ID, and this is the content. It looks like a bunch of gibberish stuff, okay? Um, I believe this is called base 64 encoding, which means it is actually encoding, you know, um, some random bits of information. Um, if you do the same experiment, your content is going to be quite different from mine. Okay. <clears throat> it says right here the host is arccis.net. The path if is the root. Okay, a single slash means it is the root. Um, send for any type of connection, so it, it's not specific to get or post, um, and it expires at the end of a session, which basically means when I close the browser, this cookie will go away. But there are also more persistent cookies where they do not go away uh, when you close the browser or even when you turn off the computer. Okay, some you know, cookies are persistent. So that when you turn off the computer, turn it back on, reboot after you know Windows update itself, okay? Because most people think you know when Windows update itself, which takes multiple reboots, things should be gone, right? Nope, not if the cookie is persistent. Sound okay? So now the question is, well, what is this doing here, okay? And who gave me this cookie? Well, the browser did. I mean, uh, the, the server did. Okay, when I ran that script, when I ran this particular script, it gave it, this is run on the server side. This is being run on arccis.net, the server. When this ran, it specifies a, an HTTP, not HTML, but HTTP header that's, you know, that sends over a cookie that is requesting the client, which is my web browser, and say, hey, web browser, would you like to store this for me, please? Um, this is a cookie, and it has a name of that really kind of long, weird name, uh, and it has all the attributes that we just talked about. Most browsers are set up to accept cookies, because if you do not accept cookies, you cannot really do anything useful online. Okay? So most you know, browsers are set up to accept cookies. Cool. So what is that going to do? Hmm. So what we'll do is I'm going to go to tools because I got tempered data already installed from last time. So I'm going to bring it up, okay? And when I bring this up, I'm going to I'm uh, I will go back to session one, and I all I'm going to do is to refresh the page, okay? I'm just going to click the refresh button here, okay? It is now refreshed. Seems like no big deal. <clears throat> we go back to um, tempered data. And it's a, it, it, it basically logs a particular request. Now, tempered data is really, really helpful you know, when you want to understand how things are actually done in HTTP. So it is basically logging and say that at time 17, 35, you know, 49, um, the duration of this particular uh, connection 
is only 59 milliseconds. This is the entire connection, okay? From the time the request is sent from the browser to the server, to the time that the server responded and the client received the entire body of the reply, it only took 59 milliseconds, okay? That's the entire connection. So the connection opened and then the connection ended. The size of the, uh, the number of bytes transmitted is only 39 bytes. This is uh, based on the get method instead of a post method. Uh, status 200, I think, means it's okay. You know, you can look it up. <coughs> Content type is text HTML, the URL, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of cool, you know, that we know all that stuff. But what is kind of interesting is when you look into the request header. The request header is going to contain a, a whole bunch of information about your browser, about what you're requesting, and about many things that you don't think of, okay? So the first thing is, you know, the request header says, you know, the host or where we are connecting to is arccis.net. Okay, that's not really a big surprise here. User agent. User agent identifies what browser you're using, okay? So in this case, not only is it identifying that I'm using Mozilla and also the version, it's also identifying that I'm running Linux. Okay, 64-bit version of Linux. I'm using X11 as a GUI engine, okay? And it even has the revision of my GUI environment. Yes? Um, I've been running a uh, Vimlike browser called a Q browser, which does not have its own user agent, but yep. I learned a lot about user agents because it borrows user agents from other web browsers, which, yep. I, which pointed out to me it is possible to spoof your user agent as oh, a totally. user agent, including older ones, yep. which I also found out if you use older ones, some web pages barely interact with you at all, like if you use a severely outdated one, yep. it can completely change the behavior of a web browser. Yep. Uh, many years ago, I was trying to watch Netflix from Linux, <laughs> and it, it didn't let me, okay, you know, because, you know, Netflix says, you know, the browsers, you know, running on Linux are not secure, and they are always thinking, oh, people are going to steal the content, right? So yeah, it's just an anti-piracy measure. They're, they're pretty much lying. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to spoof, you know, the user agent and say, no, 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 this is Internet Explorer. Trust me, it really is. <laughs> so it let me get through to certain things, and then it wants to install a silver... Silverlight? Silverlight, Silver yeah. And, and of course, you know, that's not going to install you in Linux. <laughs> <you know. laughs> these days, it's a lot easier. These days, I can run Chrome, and you know, Chrome can run Hulu, it can run Netflix, it can run you know, Amazon Prime and stuff like that. So I don't have problems here watching a movie now. You can also um, run Chromium. Hmm? You can also yep. run Chromium. Yep, it also runs in Chromium, which is the open source version of Chrome, okay? So, you know, but it, it, it is important, okay? It, it is important to know that your browser type is being sent to the other side, which also means as a developer, you know what browser is used to get to your page. So if you are trying to render something that's super duper fancy using HTML5 and some experimental feature of X HTML5, and it only works in Chrome or only works in you know, Firefox, you know, certain versions and up, you can now check and say, okay, are you running that fancy spreadsheet, your new, new client or new browser? If so, I can give you that code. If not, ah, uh, guess what? We'll go back to the old clunky code. Doesn't show as well, but you know, gets the job done. So this is really kind of helpful from the perspective of a web developer, okay? Because now you can kind of generate different code for different browsers, okay? Next one is accept, uh, accept language. So these, this is based on the protocol you know, between the two servers. Um, this basically means, you know, can we deal with, can this particular browser deal with gzip compression, okay, so that your know, content can be transmitted using fewer bytes. Ah, what about this guy? I think we have seen this guy before. This is the cookie. So the cookie, was originally generated by a server, given to the client, the browser, and say, hey, can you store this for me? But when I refresh the page, the HTTP request sent from the browser to the server says, hey, you gave me a cookie a little bit earlier, and let me give it back to you. And every single request 
now that I generate to go to that particular page or that, that entire server would include this. I can go to your pages on that server. It will still send this cookie. Why? It has to do with how the cookie is set up. So when we go back to look at how the cookie is set up, I'm trying to look into... Did it say it will expire as soon as you close the browser? Yeah, this will uh, expire when we close the browser. So, so, so it will only work if you are in the same session? Correct. And that's what it's you know, set up. It, it, it would expire at the end of session. Um, to the people in the back of the classroom, that might be harder to read because I... Let me see if I can resize this window just so that I can display that. Uh, resize. There we go. So I, maybe I can scroll up. Nope. That is broken. <laughs> I can't I can't move this one, you know, up and down. Okay. So but but why is it you know um, <clears throat> why is it sending this cookie back to all the pages? It's because of the path. Now if you are in charge of your own cookies, you can set up the path so it is not the root. Okay, but when the path is root, it means anything that is under this path will receive this cookie automatically. And guess what? Root is the first folder, right? It, it means you know, the root of the entire thing. So your pages is under the root. My pages are under the root. The home page itself is under the root. So now this cookie is being sent to every single page on this server. Now if you want to say, but I don't, I want to change this, there are options, there are ways to change it, I just cannot remember. But there are ways to limit the cookie to only go under a certain path. But most cookies are not like that. Most cookies have a path of slash. Yep. So what is the logic behind uh, sending your cookies to every page on the server? Um, then my session variables will be accessible to your page. So we are, we're not quite there yet, okay? You know, so we are, at this point, we are just, you know, I'm just illustrating what is a cookie and the mechanism of who generates the cookie and who's storing the cookie and who's sending it back, okay? So are we okay at this point in terms of, you know, the mechanisms involved as far as cookies are concerned? It's generated by the server the client store stores it at least you know uh, for a short amount of time, and then depending on the host and the path, okay, your browser will determine when to attach this cookie as a part of the HTTP header when you request a new page. Is that okay? But it's not just pages, okay. Every HTTP request will follow this particular rule. If you're requesting a PNG, it's gonna send. The cookie is gonna be sent. If you're requesting an MP3 file, it's gonna be sent. That is how they can track you. That's how the advertisement companies can track your stuff. Okay, you, you go to Amazon, you're browsing a few items, you put it into your, your shopping cart, and then you go to some other websites, like a news website, and then suddenly, whatever you were looking at, pops up and go like, hey, I think you might be interested in this. That's because you know, the cookie is um, being sent back to the whoever is owning that particular cookie. Okay? So, and you guys are saying, I don't believe you. you know, I don't think this cookie is being sent back to my page. Yep. websites too, you know, because you know, if you have a cookie placed on your computer with a, is it called double click? Okay, you know, so every time you know there is a double click image on a news website, that cookie gets sent back to double click when you load up the news website. 
And then the news website itself is like, okay, we don't care. But the advertisement from DoubleClick will, can now associate you, you know, the user, with that particular session of going to the news website. So whatever was in your shopping basket and whatever your browsing habit or browsing history that you had, it can retrieve all of that stuff, okay? So that's kind of, it's kind of creepy what you know, cookies can, can do. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is, go, is to go to a particular page of one of you. So we'll go to arccis.net and we'll go to, I'm gonna pick on Amanda this time because she's not here. <laughs> Okay, go play with some of her pages. Okay, there we go. Cool. Now we go to temper data. Okay, temper data you know, locks everything, right? And this is the last entry. So according to this last entry, let's analyze the very last entry here. So this last entry says you'll know, confirm that we went to Amanda's website. Cool, all right. So now we look at the detail. And particularly we want to look at the header of the HTTP request, which is coming from the browser to the server. And then we look at the cookie. We look at the detail and go like, oh, it is the same cookie. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, okay? Because you know, the same cookie is being sent to everything that is on this particular domain name, arccis.net, because the path that is specified by this particular cookie is a slash, which means everything under the entire server will get this cookie. So we do look at so far with you know what happens you know when the server generates the cookie, the the client stores it, and then depending on which page on which server you go into, the cookie is attached as a part of the HTTP request. Is that okay? So at this point, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, okay? Because I can look back in time, I can look at you know, some other requests here, and I can expand, you know, URL. All of these are on this website, you know, but this is kind of interesting, okay? This is the planet, okay? This is the bitmap, you know, on the home page of arccis.net, which is the same thing as the one in, on the power server. Look at this. Even when I was just requesting an image, not even an HTML document, that thing got sent. Okay. Let's, let me clean this up. Clear. And we'll go to a particular website like ABC News. Okay, is it just abcnews.com? I'm guessing it is. Okay, abcnews.com. Press the enter key. Okay, it got redirected to go, da 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 da. Okay, and I don't have any ad blockers you know, turned on here. We go to temper data. Just look at all these requests. This is from loading a single page. Okay, and you can also see from the URL, they're not all going to the same place. They're not all just going to abcnews.go.com. Some of these go to Entrust. It goes to TIQCDN. SYMCD and so on and so forth. You look into one of these things and you look at the cookie. They are all using cookies to track you. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind every time you go to a particular web page. Just remember, <coughs> you go to a single page, it doesn't mean it is only making a single HTTP request. It's making, in this case, I'm guessing, maybe around 50 in terms of order of magnitude, about 50 connections to different places. If you look at the places, here's another one, this is new, chart B is another one, and so on. So all of these other websites are basically tagging on to ABC News and say, okay, we want to buy some space on your homepage so that we can put our stuff here in order to track you Okay, some of these may be tracking your browsing habit. Some of these may be browsing, uh, maybe tracking your, your news preferences. We don't know exactly what they're tracking. Okay, you might want to kind of track down each one of these, you know, um, websites and find out what they do. Is that okay? 
Any questions about this part? I know it's not strictly re strictly uh, related to what we are talking about, but when you look at each and every single one of these, they all use cookies. So basically, what are they storing the IP address, or what are they saying? They are not storing the IP address, but okay. So what they're really storing is your uh, browsing habit, because every single time you go, if you go to uh, let's say um, Fox News, okay. Com. Foxnews.com probably share, I would say, 50% to 70% of all of these websites. So they knew, they can track you and say that, oh, you just went to abcnews.com and now you're at foxnews.com. Okay, you click on a news article, they can see that, oh, now you're looking at this particular news article. And that's how they can track your, your, your browsing habits. So like the previous question, when they go to a website and they start suggesting things to you. So they know that you were there before and this is who you are, right? So because this identifies, you know, it, it identifies which computer. This particular cookie is not identifying you per se, but it is identifying which computer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yep, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you um, had any opinion on the Ghostory Chrome extension for blocking these requests, and if you had any other recommendations for ways to control the types of uh, requests. I haven't really looked into that. Um, I use AdBlock, and I use, um, there's another one that I use. I cannot remember the name. I think it's called Privacy Badger. So I use both of those, um, and in, on certain websites, you know, they quote unquote do not work. Because some websites can detect whether you're running an ad block, you know, uh, extension, and if you are, they won't give you the content that you're looking for. Um, Ghostory gives you like a really easy to handle list of the exact kind of thing that we're seeing right here, and lets you like block them individually. Ghost script. Uh, Ghost story. Ghost story. Uh, story like uh, E R Y. E R Y. Yeah, like that. It's really weird to find it. about it. I think it's Ghostory. I just looked it up just to make sure I remembered the name of it. Spooky JS? No, that doesn't sound like it. Um, weird. It's it's this. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot read that from that far away. Sorry. That's all right. It's got a little blue Pac-Man ghost. Ghostory. Okay, Ghostory. There we go. Okay, so that might be something that I can look into, you know, but I have not done any research in this particular area. All right, so getting back to our, you know, stuff here. This web, you know, so this is the page. Doesn't seem to be very useful. Um, so what we'll do is we're gonna make this web page do something else, right? So we're gonna use session variables, okay? You guys know about the get variable. You know about the ghost, I mean the post, ghost. That thing is now stuck in my mind. Okay, we know about the get variables and the post variables, right? Because all those are reflecting things that you're sending back you know, as a part of the HTTP, either in the header part or as a part of the URL uh, that you're sending back to the server explicitly and say, oh, my name is blah, 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 this is the ID and this is how I want to sort you know, those you know, entries in the table and so on and so forth, okay? But as it turns out, you know, the, the server can maintain something that is strictly on the server itself, okay? You don't need to make a form with a hidden field to send something back, okay? It is in the form of a session variable. So you, as you can probably guess, it is just a you know, dollar underscore session, and then just the same way, okay, you can say you know, ABC, okay, whatever string you want to use as the, as the quote unquote index of this associative array, and then you can just give it a value, okay? It's like, what's up? Okay. All right, so I'm going to rerun this script on the server side. So I'm on the server side, I'm gonna rerun it. And, okay, let me rerun it on this side here. Refresh, um, and then we'll display the content again, inspect uh, view page source, there's no change. Oh, okay. Doesn't seem to do a single thing. Okay. 
then we go to the server and then we write a different script okay so we are going to write another script um, and just to demonstrate you know that you know you, you can you can go any place to to write that script I'm gonna borrow an account from one of you and this time I'm gonna I'm going to uh, borrow Tracy's account. So I'm going to do S U A R T I A R I S T P E T. Okay, so I'm Tracy now. As far as my identity is concerned. Okay, so in her folder, I'm going to write a new script. Okay, I'm going to call this session one or session two, doesn't matter what the name is. Okay, and in this script, I say. PHP um, start session again. So start session actually does two things. How come it's not? Ex oh, okay, because you know, she doesn't use VI and doesn't have syntax highlighting enabled. So start session, as it turns out, is doing two things. The first thing that it does is to do is to generate the uh, cookie if a cookie is not being sent back. So in other words, if the first request to the server does not include a cookie of that name in the in the header of the HTTP request, it will generate it. On the other hand, if the HTTP request already has a cookie attached with the name of PHP session ID, it will make use of it. So it will look up in its own quote unquote database. It's not really in the database itself, but it will look it up and say, oh, I better reload every single session variables into this script when it runs, okay? So now we can do something like this. Now we can say if, okay, is set, still works, okay? And we can say session <coughs> bracket ABC, and the then branch will do one thing, the else branch will do something else, okay? So the then branch, it will just say found it, okay? ABC is the following. Okay, session bracket ABC. Not sure whether this will work or not, so I'm, not, I'm gonna use concatenation just to be sure. Okay, dollar underscore session ABC, close that, and okay, that's it. That's all I'm gonna do. And of course, we're gonna put in the usual HTML head body. So, and then we'll put in the end too. So we'll say the end of body and the end of HTML, okay? Okay, and the else is gonna print cannot find ABC, okay, that's it. That's my entire script. And remember, this is not the same script that I wrote earlier. This is not even in the same folder. It's not even the same user on the server, okay? So now we're gonna play with this. So we'll go to here and then we say arccis.net and aristp um, ciswf410 session2.php. Okay. In, yeah? In her name. In her name. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm missing a E. Okay, there we go. I'm not sure this was to be a T. Nope. Oh, you're right. Okay. P E P E T. Okay. I got I got it reversed. Dyslexic. Yeah, that was better. This is the uh, the Carol influence. I'm I'm starting to become dyslexic. Just being <laughs> just picking up her class. Oops, you caught dyslexia <clears throat> from me. Hmm? Oops, you caught dyslexia from me. <laughs> and Carol. All right, so press the enter key. Ah, okay, we got we missed something here. Uh, call to undefined function start session. Of course, it's session start. That's why I didn't highlight correctly, and I was thinking, hey, maybe it's just no syntax highlighting. New, I type it incorrectly. There we go. All right, so getting back here, refresh. Ah, ah, it picked it up. 
isn't that, isn't that creepy? And also at the same time, convenient. Because nothing is being used on the browser. The browsers, on the browser side, the only thing that it is doing is resending back the same cookie into the header. All the magic is happening on the server side. So the server is the only one that actually store, is storing you know, what's up into the associative array called session associated with the index of ABC, but only of this session, okay? So if the rest of the class, okay, is going in and go like, oh, so that means, you know, when I go to Tracy's website, it's gonna display what's up? Well, not the first time, okay? You have to go to my page first, the my session one, to set up the session variable. Then you go to Tracy's page so they can retrieve that particular thing. But your cookie is not going to be the same as mine. Are we doing okay so far with this mechanism? When I'm, I'm just explaining the mechanism of how sessions are maintained. Any questions about this? I'm very confused even ask the question. Okay, so yeah. you're, you're confused. Um, where do we start? That's the confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe. Well, I, I typed some uh, lecture notes for this particular purpose too. Um, but I'm not going to go to the uh, Canvas website because it, it's going to generate a lot of traffic. I don't want to mess up the uh, um, template there. Yep, go ahead. Can you just show uh, the HTTP script on your website and on your page again? Absolutely. So you want to look at my at session one, right? Yeah. Okay. So let me let me open it up in another tab, so this way we can keep track of multiple tabs at the same time. Uh, this is mine. You have to go here first. So when you go here, okay, on your own computer. What's going to happen is your computer, the first time it goes to this page, is not going to have a cookie to attach to the HTTP header because you, know, you, you have not been to this page before. So when your computer goes there the first time, session start is going to notice and go like, oh, I see that you do not have a session ID to attach to the HTTP header. Okay? And then what session start is going to do is to say, in that case, I'll give you a cookie. So it's going to generate a request in the response body of the HTTP request and say, OK, here's your, your HTML document. But along with it, it's going to say, oh, here's also a little request. Please store this little cookie on your browser. OK? But that's, what, that's only going to happen the first time. At the same time, the whatever session cookie or whatever session ID it has generated, it will associate ABC as a key combined with the session ID. It will store that somewhere internal on the server. Is that okay? That part's okay. Now, uh, I mean, you say if we go to that website, but this is on your. Yeah, this is on my. You know, to go to this website, yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, you can go ahead and answer. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm just going to show you where to go here. So you go to arccis.net, my name, T-A-U-Y-E-U-N-G, uh, CISW410, and this is session1.php. So you have to go here first. Yeah, we have to know that. Yeah, you have to, you have to go here first. Then you go to the, uh, the page that I borrowed from you know, Tracy's you know, home directory. So in that particular order, if you go here first, it's going to say it's not found. So you have to go to my page first, so you can set so you can set up the session. Then it will go when you go back here, it will know. Okay. Oh, you uh, you ended up inadvertently answering my question, so uh, I'm good. Okay, I like those. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Are you uh, familiar using set cookie uh, where you can uh, enter uh, other parameters like the expiration of the? Yep. You can, 
You can certainly do that. Okay, so this is what you can do with uh, with temper data. You can actually do that too. So I'll, I'll play with this idea. So we'll go to temper data. We'll clear everything. And at this point, temper data is not tempering. Temper data is now in, in, in I guess, sniffing mode. All it's doing is sniffing the traffic, logging, displaying stuff so that you can know what is going on. So let me start temper, okay? And when I do this, oh, the other thing I might want to do is to re erase that cookie so we can start from scratch. So we can go back to here and then we just say remove selected cookie. So um, temper with request, okay, because I'm telling the other, oh, that's ABC News you know, wanting to send me something because of a timed script. You're probably running as a JavaScript. So I'm gonna have to say no, and we'll get rid of that page too. So where's abc.news? We'll say close, there we go. Get rid of that, okay, cool. But I have just removed arccis.net, the cookie on, on my own website, okay? So when I go here, I'm gonna refresh, and I will do temper this time, okay? This is the request that I, that is the, this is the request that I'm sending to the server. And you will notice that, hey, there's, there's no, there's no cookie this time. Because guess what? I just removed that cookie. So when I send a request from the browser to the server, there's no cookie to send this time. Cool. We'll say, uh, we don't have to change anything, but if you do want to change something, you can now change it. These are all up to you to change now. That's why it's called temper data, because you can actually change the header of your HTTP request, okay? So I say, okay, fine. And when it replied, uh, I cannot change that. I cannot change uh, what it is sending back. Okay, where is that? Temper data is here. So the reply from arccis.net has a, has a header like this. And on this particular header, oh, okay, the, this is the request header. This part is what the browser is sending to the server. It has no cookies in it because I just erased it. The response header is what the server is sending back to me in response to the request. And you can see this time the server sent back something like set cookie which is basically what you were earlier talking about. It is a part of the header of the response. And in this case, it gave me a different cookie, okay? This cookie has a different, uh, different uh, name, a different value, I should say. It has a different value but the same path. But PHP does allow you to set you know, all the different things related to a session, to, to a cookie, not session cookie, but related to a particular cookie we're not going to get into that in this class because we are just we are just going to use the mechanism supported by PHP sessions. So we are not we don't have to you know, deal with you know, the additional cookie issues. Okay. Are we doing okay so far with this? So with this particular mechanism, you know, as the code is demonstrating, you know, if you try to store something in one particular script. You can retrieve that in, in any other script on the same server as long as it is a part of the same path, okay? So now you can maintain shopping carts, okay? If somebody says, you know, oh, I want to add this to my shopping cart, the sh as long as the shopping cart is representable using a session you know, variable, it can, it can now be maintained. Is that okay? Now, most of the time, we actually do not use you know, sessions to maintain shopping carts or anything complex like that. The session variables usually only have to identify, are you logged in? Who are you? Are you logged in? Because right now, I'm not logged in, okay? Because you know, this particular server has no concept of logging in. There's no need to authenticate. Is that okay? Which also means if you look into Wells Fargo, you know, when we look at the, the different cookies. So I'm gonna have to stop um, temper data at this point, stop it. Okay. Stop, okay, stop temper, there we go. 
So once we stop it, we can now go back to preferences, and this time I'm going to look for Wells Fargo. <clears throat> and you can see Wells Fargo has you know several cookies that is already set, but I didn't sign in. Okay, I use a fake you know username, fake password. It failed to sign in, and it was you know, it's still using cookies to track me, to track this particular session, but it is not an authenticated session. In other words. Wells Fargo says, you know, I don't know, you know, who is associated with this particular session. I'm not going to display, you know, the amount in the checking account because I don't know who it is. Is that okay? So now that we know what a session is, the next question is, how do we create the concept of authentication? How do we sign in and say this session is now attached to a particular user? That becomes the next question. That's an interesting question. Hmm? That is the interesting question. That's a very interesting question, right? Yeah. OK. So before we answer that question using HTTP code, or HT, PHP code, sorry. Before we answer the question using PHP code, the first thing is, how would you do it? Because if we know how to do it by hand, then we can borrow that approach and do it by, you know, by coding. Okay. Database of user IDs and passwords. Okay, so you have a database and you have a table right. that can maintain information related to a user. Okay, very good. Let's go there. Okay, so that's a very good start. Okay, the good start is we go to the database. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Get get out of this script for now. Okay, this is not a very difficult script. I mean, we can always come back and look at it again. So we go to MySQL. Okay, which is a client. I just have to remember to say which um, database I'm connecting to, and we specify the password. All right, okay, we are now in the database, and we have to create a table to keep track of users now, okay? And of course, I have completely forgotten how to make a new table. <laughs> I'm gonna go to MySQL and look up I think it's create table. Okay, so show tables create. Now the backup file, you know, also contains all information that is needed to create the table. Uh, so I can always, you know, just look into that for clue. Okay. So I want to create a table, you know, for end users. So what I'll do is I am going to. Okay, I'm gonna shrink the size. Ah, it doesn't. It doesn't do it the way that I want it to do. You know, it 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 shrinks only the number of columns. Okay, I'm gonna because what I want to do is I can I want to show both the documentation and also my code at the same time. So I think this is probably okay. Can people in the back still see the bottom of the? The terminal? No? Okay. Okay, so let me try this trick. Get rid of the border of the browser so I can move things up a little bit more. Is that okay? All right, cool. All right, so we're going to say create table, give the table a name. Mm, I think users, you know, seems pretty reasonable in this case. Um, and then we'll give it, you know, some um, maybe username. Okay. Username as a varchar variable you know character and i think you know 20 characters should be enough for a username now this is also a time to stop a little bit just to pause and say do you really want to use a username as opposed to an email address to identify a particular user yeah. well either way but a lot of websites are now using email address instead of a username most of the case, you can use your username or email address. You can change that, possibly later. Yep, go ahead. Do you think that there's any uh, benefits, uh, like pros or cons, to each individual approach of what you use to um, identify a user? Yep. Well, I think email is better because you know when you, when it's username, that means you know the well, whoever is trying to sign up for an account has to remember, okay, what username did I use on this particular website? Because you know the common ones may be gone already. John, 
Okay, gone. John one, gone. <laughs> John one nine nine zero, gone. Yep, go ahead. I always use ID, like the ID value, something that's unique. So in case you need to. That's for something. internal use, not for signing in. If a user is signing in, you don't want the user to use some internal ID that you generate and say, okay, end user, remember this. Your ID is 176804. I just forgot what I said. <laughs> Which is the whole point, okay? So you want the username to be something that the user can remember easily and not some ID that you generate for internal purposes. Yep? Although um, I may be mistaken as to what's actually going on with this, but I do believe that um, ICQ back in the day uh, used <laughs> IDs. But also in modern day, I mm -hmm. do believe that Kick and Discord use an ID. Yeah, they While do. your username can always be changed, your ID consistently stays the same. Okay. So there are places where you know an ID is appropriate, but for you know web-related stuff. Um, because Discord is not web related in well, a way. You can sign into it with a web browser. You can, but that's not the only way, though. Right. You know, so that's why you know the email thing may not be appropriate. It may not may not be um, not appropriate, but it may not be as useful. Okay. Now on on websites where you want to collect the email from the users anyway, because you want notifications or advertisements and stuff like that, just use the email address. Okay, no need to have a separate user ID in addition to the email. So I would just use the email as the as the ID, as the ID that the end user uses to sign in. The second reason why this might be useful is, guess what? Every time you make up a website so that people can sign up, there will be bots signing up accounts. And that's why we have all of those measures, um, like, uh, Capture, what is the name of that thing? Captcha. Captcha. Okay, and that's why we have capture because you know because bots always like to sign up you know accounts on every single thing. So if you use email as the identifier, okay, then you can say, okay, I'm going to send you an email. You have to click on the confirmation in order to actually have the account created and activated, because otherwise it would just be tossed away. You know, after 24 hours. That request is chucked. Yep. I mean, there are still bots that are capable of getting around that, as bots that also continually create emails mm -hmm. nowadays. But that's like two or three extra steps that uh, some like very basic hackers aren't going to bother with. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to use email here. Okay. You know, for uh, as a user's um, phone identifier. Okay, so this is not the internal identifier, this is just what the user is going to use in order to keep track of accounts. Okay. And then the second one is going to be uh, an internal ID. The internal ID is just going to be an integer and I want it to be auto increment and it is a primary ID. And of course I don't think the syntax is correct here. And that's why I'm going to check it a little bit later. Okay, but I'm, at this point, it's, it's the concept that is important. And the last one is password. Okay, password is a big one. Okay, because we don't want to store passwords in plain text. In other words, we don't want to store password as you know just a var. Now the type doesn't really matter. Okay, we can we can use the type like this, but we don't want to store the actual password that the end user has chosen to use. So let's say I've chosen to use the password ABC, okay? I don't want to store ABC as the field for this particular row. Why not? Well, we going to this last week, so if the website, if your website is hacked, mm -hmm. and you have a million accounts, so all of those accounts have been hacked. Yes, so if you use the same password on other websites, mm -hmm. then when people hack into this particular table, it doesn't even have to be the entire website, just this table itself. Mm -hmm. And people can retrieve your actual password so that they can use your account name, which is also in the same table, right? right. And try out different Other places. Websites. They can try out Amazon, they can try out PayPal, you know, just to see whether that password would work or not. Okay? So you never store passwords in plain text. 
not for the protection of the site that you're working on, but for you know, access to other websites. Okay? You don't want the, the password itself to be available. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. So we'll just say, okay, we'll reserve 256 characters for password. And I'm gonna look up the syntax here because I am pretty sure I got the syntax incorrectly. To take a look at the primary key part of your, your create table statement. Yeah. I, the documentation, I think it's a little bit incorrect. I know, I know it oh, is. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm gonna look up the actual reference manual and, f and find out, oh, well, this is not it. Uh, reference manual, creating a table. There we go, create table syntax. That is what we want to know. <clears throat> okay, that's not. There we go. Okay. So we want to look up column name, column definition. We got that. And then primary key. And then we also need auto increment. Okay, data type is integer. Okay, we got that. And where's the auto increment? Okay, so let me let us just you know, kind of quickly go over the uh, the. This is what we call a syntax description. <clears throat> So each form you know, starts with create. Some has the option, or they all have the option of a temporary, which is, not, which is not the case in our case. And then table is the word that we have to type, and then the table name, which we have already. Create definition needs to be enclosed by parentheses in this case. Um, and then within create definition, each create definition looks like this. It starts with a column name, and then followed by a column definition, or constraint, and then the primary key, and so on. A column definition starts with a data type, which is in integer is a, is, a, is a data type. So integer is good, we know that part is okay. Primary key is okay as well. And we just need to find out how to do the auto increment. So I'm gonna look it up. Increment. Auto increment is underscored. So here we have data type, which is integer. Auto increment. Primary key. Okay, so I think the only change I need to do is to change the auto increment to auto underscore increment. Right, so instead of primary idea. Oh, primary key. Primary key. Yep. There we go. All right. Press the colon. Press the enter key. Woo! -hoo, it actually worked. <laughs> but I cannot remember the syntax of you know, of SQL. Okay, I, I don't use it enough to really remember all the uh, the syntax. And that's why you know, learning how to read the syntax description is really helpful. Okay, because you know I I cannot remember you know how to do a select statement with join and then have another select inside it, I have to look it up. Oh, I have select inside it, select inside and insert, you know, simply a queries like that. Yep. I think the really bizarre thing about MySQL is because the code is more or less written in plain English, it's very easy to read and very hard to remember. It is extremely hard to remember because it's very verbose. Now, if you want something that is hard to remember and hard to type, try COBOL. Oh. <laughs> You read a COBOL program, it reads like a story. So there, there actually are COBOL talks. <laughs> you haven't really seen that, I just said to you. Oh, no. <laughs> There's so many old databases like they use COBOL those that they're, but, that's in demand to know it. But do you know what COBOL stands <laughs> for? Um, B stands for business, yeah, yeah. L stands for so language. So basically the idea <laughs> was that this is a language that business people can write. No programmers need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much for that assumption, so right? So much for that assumption. <laughs> but, but it was made with that intention. Yep. Identification, division, program ID, shortest program. 
procedure division, display prompt, display ID, stop run. Okay. Yep. It's it's very verbose. You know, things read yeah. like it really flows. You can you can read a COBOL program and almost immediately understand what it's talking about, yeah. See, which you cannot do with C. So when you went from <laughs> when I went for a training, you know, to after the rest, I went. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, you must document actually. Half of your code should be documentation. And then I go in an account and I say, where is the documentation? So what do you mean documentation? Cobol is self-documenting. <laughs> <laughs> um, it may be self-documenting the mechanical aspect, but the rationale part needs to be explained, right? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. there's that separation of yeah, yeah. this is the implementation, but right. this is the idea that it is implementing. Yeah. So the commenting applies, you know, to be to the to this concept to the ideas, but not so much the mechanical part. Now, but if we if you look at a C program, okay, especially an older C program, where C programmers pride themselves on the most concise way of doing things or the most convoluted way of doing things, those programs cannot be easily understood because they put auto increment inside an expression and they put assignment inside another one dereference outside the entire thing and they do they do crazy stuff like that and the C programming language specifically is designed to allow that to happen <laughs> okay so I'm not going to get into the uh, the discussion of you know the pros and cons of, of different uh, programming languages now but uh, so we're going to get back to um, this okay so we'll explore different ways of storing passwords okay because the topic right now is Okay, we cannot store password as it is. Okay, you know, if my password is ABC, I don't want to store that password as ABC because if someone hacks into this particular uh, table, they can retrieve my actual password, my actual you know email address. And I, if I use the same password on all the websites, I'm in big trouble because now you know this whoever gets into this table can now get into all of my other accounts, right? So. Should we convert it? MD5. Okay, so that the first idea is MD5. Okay, so the first idea is why don't we try MD5? Okay, MD5 of ABC is this. We go like, oh, that's pretty cryptic right there. Okay, so the idea is you store the MD5 hash. Okay, it's not encryption. It is called a hash function. There's a there's a big difference between encryption and the hash function. So this is what we call hash value, which basically means there's a known algorithm, okay? Well-known algorithm. Just look it up, okay? You look up MD5, you know, algorithm, and you can locate, you know, the implementation in C. You can look up the implementation in C++, in Java, in PHP, you know, you can look it up, you know, easily, okay? I'm just going to skip to the algorithm part which is probably linked from the top. There we go. So the algorithm has a pseudocode, and this is the pseudocode, you know, it, which is probably Pascal um, inspired because of this symbol, okay? Pascal use, likes to use that, but it has, you know, comments that is borrowed from modern C++ programming languages. So this is just a, you know, pseudocode. But anyway, the algorithm, the algorithm itself is published, okay? It is well known, and you can find implementation of MD5 in just about any programming language that you can think of, even COBOL, okay? Okay, so what is the idea? Why, why, is, why is this more secure? Well, because if this is actually being stored on the server, then how do we do authentication? The authentication code is gonna grab the password that is actually entered by the end user, do an MD5 cache on that. And the MD5 hash of whatever the user enter should match the stored MD5 hash of the password, which means the password itself is never stored on the server. It is just the MD5 hash that is stored. Yes. So the idea is if somebody breaks into this computer and steal this entire table, they do not get the, the password. They get the MD5 hash of the table of the password. They can do a reverse engineering and find out password. So 20 years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago, with limited computer computation power, limited storage, and stuff like that, that's enough to stop you know most hackers, except for the CIA and Homeland Security. 
because they because we pay them to buy all the super duper computing equipment and they can crack it. Okay, but to the average you know hacker, they look at the MD5 hash and go like, okay, I'm giving up. Twenty years ago, today they look at the MD5 hash and go like, I can deal with this. Yeah. Okay. So the way you deal with MD5 hash is called a rainbow table. Okay, the rainbow table is well explained here. It is a pre-computed table for reversing cryptographic. I would cross out cryptographic here. It's just a hash function. So it can reverse the hashed value back to some text that can give you that same hash value. Okay, so just as an example, I used ABC, right? to generate this particular hash. But guess what? If I look up the rainbow table, it might have another text, you know, like 162J, you know, exclamation point, that turns out to have the same hash value, okay? Hash value does not guarantee no collision, which means different strings, different text, can generate exactly the same hash. But in the past, 20 years ago, it is really difficult to go through all the possible strings, all the possible text, to see which one will generate exactly the same hash as being stored on the server. Today, it's different. Storage is dirt cheap. Computation power is dirt cheap, okay? The cloud makes it possible for anyone to run a super duper computer for a few minutes and not really have to pay a lot of money, okay? Which basically means with this hash, I can go to a particular rainbow table, copy, paste, look up, and I can find the text, the actual text that I can enter as password in order to match that particular MD5 hash. Okay, MD5 hash is no good anymore. Okay. There's another one called SH1, SHA1, SHA1. So SHA-1 is another uh, cryptographic hash function, but once again, it is a hash function, which means the algorithm is well published, okay? Which also means it is susceptible to the same kind of attack, okay? Somebody with all the processing power and the storage can generate a table and say, these are all the possible hash values, and these are the strings to generate that particular hash value. So if you store your password as, as SHA SHA1, the same approach can be used. Another rainbow table can reverse look them. Yep? Going back here to this was generated by MSA. So then what was the logic to publish the, the solution to the code? Well, the code itself has to be published because in order, to, in order for MySQL in, to generate the hash to store it, it needs to know the algorithm. So the, the idea of being secure in mean is based on the assumption that it cannot be reversed. Given the hash value, you cannot find out what string can generate that particular hash value. That is the only way that this mechanism yeah, can be secure. you tell me how to generate this number, if I'm smart enough, I can figure out how to do that. Not smart enough, just fast enough to do it. Not yep, go ahead. Does the NSA or the this all time? Well, let's find out what time. This is because it is superseded by SHA two already. So SHA one is outdated already. Okay, so we look up SHA one and let's see. First published nineteen ninety five. That's what, twenty years ago? More than twenty years ago? Totally outdated. There is now a SHA-3. So what you notice is in SHA-3, the number of bits is even more. So let me, let me see if I can find out you know, exactly how many bits. But the idea is still the same. You know, it is just the number of bits that is different. Um, OK, this is not telling me enough. But you have to also make sure that whatever browser or whatever uh, database you're using supports it. 
Um, so this one, does it say how many bits is the in the hash? Because ultimately that is what you're looking for, is how many bits. It doesn't say anything about the the width. Nope, that doesn't tell me. Okay, SHA-3 is not meant to replace SHA-2 as no significant attack on SHA-2 has been demonstrated. So let's look up SHA-2 then. SHA-2 the digest has a size of, in terms of bits, 224, 256, 384, or 512. Okay, and we can we, we look up SHA-1, and SHA-1 has a digest size of 160. So one is 160 bits. The other one can be up to 512 bits. You look at those numbers and go like, okay, so one is just you know, about three times as difficult to hack to hack compared to the other to the other one. Nope. It's two it's to the power. To the power or whatever, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, go ahead. I just feel as though, in, uh, since we're discussing, um, like, which ones have and haven't been broken yet, that mm -hmm. um, as soon as quantum computing becomes available, uh, which is going to become available to the government first, of course, because they have the most funding to make advancements in it, um, it's easily going to be able to deal with SHA-2 and SHA-3 because it can deal with byte orders from the amount of that is required for SHA-2 and upwards by a quantifiable amount. Mm -hmm. Yep. But we are making the assumption that you know quantum computing is not going to be in this, in this picture because you know, if that is in this picture, everything that you learn in this class is out the door. Oh well, yeah, I'm just saying it's worth <laughs> There's no such thing as sequential programming anymore. Yeah, it's just worth, it's just, I just think it's, it's, it's worth, worth mentioning. being aware of in the future because all of our jobs are going to change. Oh yeah, yep. The uh, okay, uh, I I'll save it for a little bit later, but you know, but this one is only two thousand one, which is still a long time ago. So what what is the big difference is the width. So even with the smallest digest size of SHA two, compared to the size of you know or the width of SHA one, it is already quite a bit of a difference. This is one hundred sixty, this is two hundred twenty four. 160 and 224, so in terms of the size of the rainbow table, what are we talking about? 224 minus 60 is 62, I think. Yes? Okay. So the when you look at the size sizes of the rainbow table, 1 SHA-2 is 2 to the power of 62, the size of the rainbow table of SHA-1. Okay. How many of you have two fingers? As I thought. So that's why you know binary numbers do not stick, right? Let's convert two to the power of sixty-four into a decimal number. Okay? Do you guys know the trick to quickly do that conversion? Two to the power of ten is about ten twenty is ten to twenty-four, which is about one thousand. So two to the power of sixty-two is a million times four, approximately. Okay, so we are talking about, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, six zeros, okay? No, I take it back. No wonder you're looking at me like funny. Okay, because uh, we are looking at 18 zeros. Okay, so I take it back. So it is uh, four followed by 18 zeros as a base 10 number, okay? That is the, that's the factor between the rainbow table of char one versus char two. Okay, if that is not sticking, I'll just write it here. Four followed by one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, if the table of SHA-1, if the rainbow table of SHA-1 is X, the, table, the rainbow table of SHA-2 is X times 4 followed by 18 zeros as a base 10 number. 
So even with today's computation power and today's storage solution, it is still a pretty big number. And that's why SHA-2 is considered more secure compared to SHA-1 because we don't have a rainbow table yet. Okay? Is that okay? What about MD5? How can we say MD5 is basically by today's standard a toy, okay, compared to, to the SHA-2? So when you look up MD5, okay, it, it gives you the uh, description pretty much right away. It's only 128 bits. 128 bits, okay? And you might think 2 to the power of 128 is a pretty large number. Not anymore. Used to be a large number, but not anymore. Okay, now I'm not trying to date anyone here, but if anyone remember that a 20 megabyte hard drive was like top of the line, I remember those days, I'm old, okay? I have no problem admitting that I'm of that age. See, I remember the Security Pacific Bank, I remember how people do remember that. That's back in the they, 80s, right? So they, they got a one terabyte hard drive. Mm -hmm. And I was, was living in LA. So in downtown LA, the main branch, they had out in a display with all these red lights blinking. Mm -hmm. They know how great things they have. Nobody else has it. And they have a one terabyte hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> So now your PC has it. <laughs> so let's say in 1980, I'm in, I'm called at 87 ish, okay? Uh, yeah, around that time. Yeah. Um, let's say you know, at that time, your know, 20 megabyte hard drive was considered king of the hill, okay? Now it is 2017, which is 30 years later, okay? Only 30 years. What is a typical you know, hard drive size that you can buy these days with a desktop computer, not a laptop and a desktop? Because it it's in terabytes. Oh, it's in terabytes. I think it's in four to five terabytes range now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as a quote unquote slightly up yeah, the, the higher end. The end is one terabyte. Okay, so, we look, so let's say it's four terabytes, okay? How much off are we talking about? Uh, huge. A lot. A lot, a lot. okay? But how long do you think this will take to catch up? More than 30 years. <laughs> okay? So, so when we think about cryptography and stuff like that, we kind of have to look back into history, not for the sake of um, being you know, nostalgic. It's like, oh, I really miss my full-size five and a quarter inch hard drive, which can also double as a doorstop, <laughs> right? While it's running. Yep. You can, uh, Yes, there are, there are those videos as well. So people are very good at that too. Okay, but what, we, what, what we're looking for is how much progress is made in 30 years. And then we say progress from the next 30 years to 2047 is going to be faster. Okay, it's not going to be off by this order of magnitude anymore. It's going to be more than that. Okay? But even with that projection, this is still considered a really, really big number. Okay? Okay, let's, let's, let's just step back here and figure out, okay, if, if we're just comparing four megabytes to four terabytes, how many zeros are we talking about? From million to billion is three zeros, right? From billions to trillions is another three zeros. We're talking about six zeros in 30 years of time, in terms of order of magnitude. This one has got 18 zeros. So even with, if we bump up and say that, okay, we can cover nine zeros in 30 years, this will still take 18 years to catch up. So that's why SHA-2 is the better way to do it. Okay, if you are going to use hash function, to hash passwords, use SHA-2, S-H-A-2. So the next question now is, can MySQL deal with SHA-2? Okay, so we look at all the encryption and compression function of uh, MySQL, and SHA-2 is indeed available. And you can specify you know, the hash length, 
The difference between the hash length is the longer the length, obviously the more secure it is, but it also takes more time to compute. So if you're running on a relatively slow platform and you have a lot of traffic, you may want to consider a, a shorter length. So when you look up this uh, documentation, um, and do, 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 do. So 224 is also what they use in the example. So we'll go ahead and just you know, use the same you know, script here, copy, put it into here, and paste it. There we go. And press the Enter key. And you can see how you know one only has this many digits, and then the other one has significantly more digits. Because this is giving us exactly 224 binary digits, known as bits. And this is giving us 128 bits. Each digit is known as a hexadecimal digit, okay, your know, base 16. So one digit is representing four bits, which is also telling me that if you count the number of digits here, it is 224 divided by four, which turns out to be 56. So that should be 56 characters here, as opposed to 128 divided by four, which is 32. So that is what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to store our passwords using SHA2, which is a hash function, so that it is nearly impossible to reverse the hash back to the original text. Is that okay? Yes. Now this is kind of cool in a way too. So even if the even if the site itself is hacked, okay. Um, people still cannot sign in as another person because you can look at this whole thing and the question is how do you know this is the hash of ABC? It is not practically reversible. Okay, so we will basically store passwords as SHA2 hashes. Is that okay? All right. So now we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and write some scripts. Okay, so we'll go back to the other prompts, okay, we'll go back to here, go back to my folder here, and we have the table already set up, describe users, okay, so users only has um, email, it has got ID, which is internal use only, you know, but to the external world, you know, it has no particular meaning, and it's got password, okay. I don't really need 256 characters, because we just computed earlier, the 56 characters is already sufficient to store a SHA-2 um, hash that only has 224 bits, okay? All right, so now that we have this, let's go back and look at the script, okay? We we'll go back to session1.php, and this time we, we, we can do a little bit more than what we have done so far, okay? So this time we'll go ahead and make a form so that people can sign in. So we'll say print, and this time we have a form. And inside the form, we're going to have input text type is text, uh, name is you email, <clears throat> and value is going to be you know what whatever you pass back. Input type is password. Name is password. Okay. And then we'll have a submit button. Like so. And of course, this is totally insecure, but you know it is easy to understand and read. So I'm going to leave it the way it is. It's not using post. It's not going through HTTPS. So we go back to that page, refresh, and now we have the, you know, the one is the username. Okay, so we can type in the username here. Some user somewhere, add somewhere, okay, add somewhere, and this is the password. And you can see how smart the browser is. The smart the, the browser recognizes the names of the fields inside the form because one is called password and it automatically says this is not good this is not secure I know you're trying to log in don't 
<laughs> That's what it's saying, okay? But since we're just kind of toying with you know the idea, it's okay. So we'll just say, you know, some password, okay? And then we press the submit query thing, and from the URL, we can definitely tell what I, I just entered, right? So email is some user, and then percent four zero is the at sign, at you know, somewhere, and then the password is just you know, some password. Okay, that's what I typed, you know, when I submitted the form. Okay, and this is why it's not exactly you know secure because you know because of this reason. But that's okay because you know, what we want to do is to say okay now that we can submit the form, what are we going to do? First of all, you know, what are, we haven't really set up an account yet, have we? So the first thing we want to do is to be able to set up an account, okay? So we need a different button to set up an account, or different form if you want to. So we go back to this thing here, and you know, we'll, we'll just make this, you know, our um, uh, create user form. And then we'll specify this is the username or email. Email is this. And then this one is going to be the password. And then we'll use br to break the two lines. And then we'll refresh just to make sure that it looks good. Okay? Looks good enough to me. So the idea is I want to be able to enter an email, enter the password, click submit, and it will create a new user entry for me. Okay. So at this point, I'm not going to be doing the uh, duplicate check. In other words, I'm not going to check that another user already has the same password or the same email address. So we'll go ahead and just you know, do the insert, which means I'm going to have to borrow some code from my database you know, programs. So you, oh, this is not it. Okay. Rep Ah, admin is good. So you want to look to admin.php. There we go. So we want to copy line 66 to here. And we we'll paste it here. Okay. Any any place up right after uh, session start is going to be okay. And this is the last part. Remember, the first part of the script should always check what action is requested. Okay? The rest, you know, would go later. So the generation of the HTML code has to occur after you interpret what the user may be requesting you to do. So in this case, the submit button doesn't have doesn't have an entry. Is that because I don't have a name for that? Probably so. Probably. Yep. So name is uh, create user. There we go. That's probably it. There you go. Email, password, and we still don't have the submit button. Huh? Sorry? You said refresh now. Oh, refresh. I don't have a value, but that's not needed. So in this case, we do have create user, you know, being here, and then we have submit query. Okay, that, that's good. Okay. So the first thing I do, you know, when I write a program, you know, now that I know the basic idea is working, I started to define the strings. Okay, so I started to define email as email, uh, password as password, 
and then the submit button which is create user is create user so the only reason why I'm doing this is because I want to be very consistent so I don't make you know stupid mistakes so here instead of using email spelled out like this it's str email instead of password it is str password and instead of create user it is dollar str create user all right so the script should still work pretty much the same way and we double check it is working pretty much the same way so now we go back to the script and say okay how do we handle this request remember when you handle the request you always do it before you generate HTML code for this particular page which means you might be helpful okay I'm not you know saying a hundred percent you know with a hundred percent and certainty but it might be helpful to define a function to do it just so that you can offload you know all that logic to another block of code somewhere else in your program but I'm just going to comment here and say you know process uh, request and then this part here is to generate HTML code so now we have two distinct sections of this particular script okay so when I'm processing requests you know it is the usual stuff okay no mystery here this is something that we have done you know, many many times I'm using get here you know which is not very secure okay so don't do this when you're actually doing something like this you always use post and always make sure that you are sending it through an HTTPS request okay because then it will be encrypted um, and whatever you send as password is not susceptible to sniffers anymore but in this case I'm just testing it right now so I'm not it's not a big deal <clears throat> and we'll say str create user because that's the name of the button itself of submission so if so we got stuff to do okay. create user so this is something that we have seen many many times already you know how to insert an item into um, a table so the query is really just you know insert into okay it's case insensitive so I might as well just do it like this insert into users um, and I'm going to specify what fields I'm inserting and what value I'm using to insert into it so insert into users the fields that I need to specify would be email and also password the values of those things would be as follows so this is where you know, the um, mysql i underscore escape real underscore escape underscore string is going to it's going to be helpful so here we have mysql i underscore real underscore escape underscore string it's going to be useful because I don't want someone to attach something else in addition to this so now we specify um, get okay before this we should probably have some more check a little bit earlier so this is dollar str first one is email and then we okay I'm forgetting the syntax here a little bit because in values we have to use open parentheses um, with uh, with the quote itself um, to start the value okay and because I'm, I was using single quotes I have to use a single quote to end here there we go okay that's better and then we continue with another quote okay to end the quote of the, this particular string and then we specify another quote this is a start quote this is the quote to end the string itself contact concatenation and then another mysql i real escape string get str uh, password now this is okay I, I'm gonna fix this later okay it will be fixed because I'm using I'm storing the plain password at this point okay so we and this parentheses concatenation open quote back tick quote 
backslash quote and then we can close the parenthesis and that should be the insert statement so we can out now end this Are quote you missing a, a right bracket on a uh, right bracket on oh close bracket here correct thank you good job all right so i think that would be the query and i'm going to do one thing that many of you will go like oh really you're doing it now i'm going to go back to admin because you know it seems like there are certain things that i'm going to do all the time so I'm going to go back to admin and pull those things out. In other words, I'm going to look at um, run query. Oops, run query. Keep typing it in the wrong way. There we go. Okay, this is the definition of run query. Starting on line 154 to here. Okay, and then we'll say tax cool functions okay. all that's going to do all this file is going to contain are the cool functions that I have so we'll take it from here line 154 to here 154 to here delete go to the other file and paste okay going back to the original file which is my admin and oops go back to the first line yeah, go pick a good place maybe here and we just say include uh, tax cool functions dot php so now i can share code between php scripts is that okay does everybody see what i'm doing and also understand why i'm doing this okay. what prompted me to do this you can give me the honest answer, I won't be offended. Well, one thing I had saw you back to before, and you were saying uh, run query and power tabulator, and I yeah. didn't find it later after the day I missed it. So maybe there's no reason that you can do it. So right. I but, what it but what is the rationale that I'm doing it now? Well, the standardization of your code. So yeah. Mm -hmm. You're lazy. Exactly. It. It's pure and simple laziness. <laughs> okay, but it's laziness in the form of let me do something smarter so that I don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Okay, so that is why we are doing something like this. Now, is there one seems to be pretty useful too? So, from line three down to line 24, we'll do the same thing three to line 24, do a delete, switch to the other file. Okay, say first, switch to the other file, and then do a paste. I'm, I'm copying the functions that I find useful in multiple scripts, put into one single place, so I can just include it. So you're like, you were saying COBOL is writing verbose, right? Yep. So everyone used to write like 300 lines of code to figure <laughs> out dates. Like union dates, like 30 days from now, 180 days from now, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. That used to be everyone their own code for like 300 lines. Now there are standard functions. Now you, you do it in one line. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a that's a pretty good example. Yeah. Something seems amiss here, but it doesn't say anything. Well, I'll let the I'll let PHP figure out what is wrong here. So we can say if run query, and of course I have completely forgotten all the parameters. So we'll. Take a look at the function. Ooh, we took out a little bit too much from the other program, I think. Uh, yep, we took out way too much. Uh oh, this is not good. <laughs> I took out a little bit. I took out a big, bigger chunk than I really should have. We'll, we'll fix that later. Um, this is get value. Oh boy, I took out. I took out a whole bunch of code that I really should not take out. So this stuff has to go back to the, to to the original code. Uh, okay, thirty-eight. 
to here, 38 to here, delete. We go back to admin, because otherwise my admin is not gonna work. And then we also need that print back here. Yeah, I took out a little too much, <laughs> a little too aggressive. Okay, this is one query. So we need link, we need query, the query result, and also the line number. All right, so we can now go to session one and finish that over here. So we got link, we got query, query result, which is not really needed in this case, and also underscore, underscore, line, underscore, underscore, like so. And if it does return true, that means the query just went through just fine, so we are good. So we can always just you know, print something to confirm, okay. Okay, um, user created, okay. <clears throat> and then down here, we can also, you know, just say, um, if is set confirmation, print confirmation like so it is it's really just for confirmation purposes it's not really that big of a deal okay then we can check out this code here that is no longer really useful okay so what do you think we're still missing one thing right because at this point I'm still storing the password as plain text so I want to change that so it's not plain text anymore, which also means we store as the second item. We're not going to store the string all by itself. We're going to say, you know, it is char2, okay, and then whatever string is, and then we end the string right here, comma, number of bits, which is 224, close parenthesis, and we are missing something. <clears throat> the SHA2 open paren is not, oh, okay, it is matched correctly, never mind. Okay, so we are good so far. And then we'll run this, refresh the page. Eh, okay. I, I, I forgot to pass um, link to real escape string, so that's why it's failing. Okay. Okay. Keep forgetting that too. So we have to pass link to, let's see, that's, and there's one before that. Nope, yep, that's the right one. There we go. Try one more time. Uncaught error, call to undefined function one run query. Oh, I forgot to <coughs> include that file that includes everything that's useful. So we now have include um, tax cool functions.php and in real life do not name your files like that kind of goes without saying right okay. <clears throat> there we go woohoo okay so we can say tag at arccis.net and then for the password we'll just do asdf submit query user created what do we do now Exactly. Okay, so do not try to write the script, continue to write the script, and test authentication as if you know the entry is actually created. Because we don't know for sure. Okay? So check it outside of the script first. So this is why you know the command line interface is really useful because it is independent to your PHP code. Okay? So we use MySQL um, database name dash P. And then we check it here. We say select all from users, and then we check. Okay, somebody else be, be somebody gave it to me. Oh, was it myself? That was myself, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. No, 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 no. I just put in the uh, the SHA two, so somebody beat me to the punch. It's okay. You don't know. But it did store the password as an empty not empty five, but SHA two hash. 
um, we got the email address here, and this is user ID two. The ID is not useful at this point. Okay, it will be useful later on. Okay, it will be useful later on as a session as a session variable because then we can see who has logged in. Okay, but at this point, we are, we just created an account. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to copy session one to login uh, one dot php, and we'll do some modifications. So login one is not going to be used to create an account anymore. We'll just be using it to sign in. Okay. So what does it mean to say, okay, we are signing in, we are authenticating? This is what it's going to do. So this one we redesign the form. Okay. So first of all, we redesign the form so it doesn't say create user form. We'll say this is a authentication form or user login form. Okay, login is fine. Okay. Email address and then the submit. But we don't want to say create user anymore. We'll just say login. Login is good, right? Okay. So we go back here and then we say we don't have create user anymore. Instead, we have login. And we just name it as login. Okay, the rest probably can be the same. And of course, we don't check for create user. We have here you know, check for login. And we don't do insert anymore. Okay. So we're, I'm keeping the skeleton of this code, but I'm removing the parts that I don't need anymore. So what are we really trying to do? What what kind of query should I run? in order to check, hey, you know, should I consider this user authenticated or not? Select to where to the condition. Okay, so we want to select. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's let's pick a select. <clears throat> so we say query equals to quote select. All right, so what are we selecting? Yes. All you need is the, 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 that string that is Yes, we want to check the empty file, right? right? So, do you want to have the script to do the comparison, or do you want MySQL to do the comparison? My you can do it either way. Okay, so go ahead. So basically, you will, before you come in here, you will use MySQL. No, you will take the password, and then MySQL convert the password. Okay. So we can now say, you know, uh, value of password is, okay, uh, assuming it is here, okay, it is str password, it is a get variable, and then we can do the same thing with email, okay, and of course we want to protect everything by using mysql i real escape string. And this time I remember to pass link first. Okay, and we'll do the same thing over here. Okay, so now it, it's, it's just easier to read. Okay, because I can also do a string expansion or in string expansion at this point because those two variables are now protected. Okay. So what are, what are we selecting? You know, what do we want the SQL Server to come back with? What about this? Okay, you guys let me know what you think. Okay. We should always uh, also convert the password in here before we compare it to the which is stored. How about this? Would this work? to me. What about this query? What do you think? Okay, I see some shaking. Um, I don't know. It can be any expression, right? Equal is just a comparison. It's, it's a part of... Okay, so let's check whether this can be done using, a, using the MySQL client, okay? 
because I have a suspicion that this actually is okay, but I can be wrong, you know, because... Uh, there we go. So, you can compare. Okay, very good. So now we say, can we actually run that query? Okay, so let's just say that we're trying to sign in correctly. See what happens with that query. So we say select um, SHA2 um, in quotes ABC. Did I use ABC as the password or ASDF? ASDF, ASDF okay. See, that's the best protection. Even I cannot remember the password. <laughs> Equals to password. Um, where oh okay I have to specify form that's I forgot about that too okay where but the important part is here email equals to um, what did I, what did I use for that one ah I cannot remember I think I used tag at arccis.net probably not so but but this is good too because I know for sure this is not the right password or the right email address. So it comes back with an empty set. Okay, so if the user does not exist, okay, if there's no match, it comes up with an empty set, which also means when you look at the number of rows that it comes back with, it's zero. Okay, there's no result. Cool, not a problem. Now we double check and see what is actually in that table. So I use tag at arccis.net. Okay, very good. So now we can now fix this one, arccis.net. And that should have a match. And it does have a single one. Okay, it's good. What if I enter the wrong password? If I enter the wrong password, then the password that I enter is going to be here. So let's say I enter the wrong password like that. Press the enter key, and then the single result that it comes back with is a zero. So as far as the script is concerned, it actually has the ability to differentiate between the user does not exist, as opposed to, this is the wrong password. But am I going to tell the end user this? No. no. <laughs> I'm just going to say, authentication failed. Why? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> because if you tell the end user that the password is wrong, then if it is from a hacker, the hacker will know the email is correct. The password is wrong. Try another password, right? Dictionary attack, feeding another one. Okay, cool. So this tells me that my script really should work, except you know, in the script itself, I need to check a few things, okay? Not just one. So this is the query. The query is select, you know, SHA2, the actual password entered, 224 is the length of the um, hash function equals to the password which is retrieved from the table and I forgot to specify from users because you know that is obviously important okay okay there you go from users where email equals to quoted you know the act the entered email address okay so after I run this query okay I'm gonna have three possible things that can happen the first one is if row equals to my SQL I fetch row query result then we'll do something here. If not, we'll do something here. This part is corresponding to no row returned, which means the user doesn't exist. That email does not match any entry in the table. Is that okay? So I will only use comments here, okay? I will say email uh, does not match any rows in user's table, okay? I will decide what to do, do I will decide what to do next, later. This one means, you know, it, it matched the email, okay? Now I need to find out, okay, did it match the password? So now I say if row bracket zero because there's only one item on that row, okay, the, a single number, either zero, which means it does not match, or a one, which means it matched, okay. So I can now say if row 
bracket zero equals to one or anything other than zero, okay, we'll do one thing, else we do something else. So you can see what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm constructing the conditional branches first before I stuff these branches with actual actions to perform. So in this case, you know, uh, sign in, login is successful. This one is wrong password. And then this one, this email does not match any rows. Login is successful. Seems pretty really easy to do. You know, I want to say, okay, now this particular session is authenticated, and I want to remember, you know, who signed in. Okay. Which also means I might want to do one more thing in the query because I want to know who signed in. Okay, who's the, who's that user? So I might want to put this ID here just so that I can get it back, right? So now we can say dollar underscore session. I know, I know. <laughs> Late night classes. Yep, well, it's been a long day for me, but <laughs> I got this. <laughs> and half a bottle can sustain this long. Think about what happens when I drink the whole bottle first. <laughs> I used to have just made you like regular instead of like. Yeah, that's because of the HDD thing. ADD, ADHD thing. I don't have the H, so ADD. Hey. Hmm? You ate all that food. Sorry? You ate all the food. Yes, I did eat all the food. I went to uh, Sakura, you know, it's a new buffet place. Oh, I almost went there. Over on uh, El Camino. For the money, it is actually not too bad. You know, if you think about getting a hamburger, you know, how much how much is it gonna cost if you are to go to let's say, you know, McDonald's or Carl's Jr. and you say, Okay, I'm gonna have dinner here. How much is it is it gonna cost you? Uh, I eat less than the average person, but that's even ten dollars for me. Well, so. that's exactly ten dollars when I went to the buffet place. Okay. Where, you know, chicken looks like chicken and beef looks like beef and fish looks like fish and squid looks like fish. Squid. Squid, squid, okay. As opposed to you go to McDonald's and go like, mystery meat. <laughs> to be fair, I, don't, I think it's a bit cheaper at McDonald's, but not by much. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Oh, the pink slime, that is. Pink slime. Yeah, they call it the pink slime which is basically the ground up stuff of all the trimming and all the parts that you don't want to sell on its own. Yep. Okay, so we know that you know, once successful is, when login is successful, we want to create this session ID uh, or the session variable called ID. So from here on, all the successive um, page pages that actually use the you know, session start will identify and say, oh, this particular ID has signed in correctly, okay? And that's how we can maintain the illusion that the session is now active. All the subsequent page loads is now related to this particular end user. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. This is huge, okay? Because you know, before today, we never had a mechanism to do it. Now we have the most basic mechanism to keep track of whether a session is associated with an authenticated user or not. Okay, very good. What if it is the wrong password? What, what are you gonna do you know, if you want to make sure that you know, things cannot go too wrong when you know, somebody entered the wrong password? What, what do you think happens if I try to sign into Wells Fargo using the right user ID or the wrong password like 16 times in a row? Yep. Um, they have something that detects like how many times you failed and then says like, hey, you basically need to go on a timeout because there's a pretty good chance if you're entering it that many times without suggesting something else like oh, you forgot your password, which takes time in and of itself. Exactly. You're probably trying to like brute force it. Yep, exactly. So we want to kind of emulate that ability over here. 
Okay. In fact, Wells Fargo will, will only give you like five chances, not sixteen. <laughs> they will just, they will freeze your account and tell you to either call the number that is on the back of your bank card or walk into a branch to reset it. Okay, which is safe. Okay. Or use your uh, passphrase and you know, your security questions to reset your password. Yeah. yeah, you can use a security question to reset the password, which I can never remember the the answers to. So I always have to walk into the branch. <laughs> They might have cookies or donuts on the day, so I, I'll take my chances. <clears throat> okay, so we might want to emulate that particular effect. So we w what we'll say is if is set, okay, and we'll say dollar session. So once we are done with this, you know, we'll convert all the literal strings you know, back into this, the variables, okay. But this time we'll say um, number of you know failed login, okay. So I'm checking, is it set already? Okay, else, something else, okay. If it is already set, one thing I'm gonna do is just this. <coughs> Session num failed login plus plus. I'm just gonna increment it. The other one is gonna initialize it, okay. So this is just gonna be initializing it to you can initialize it to one, you can initialize it to zero, it doesn't really matter because the number is just gonna be off by one, okay? If it is zero, it means you have failed to log in once. If it is two, it means you have failed to log in three times already and so on. So whether you initialize it to one or zero really doesn't have any practical difference. Um, but for most people, if you'd like to count from one, fine, initialize it to one. Is that okay? But there's one more thing that I might want to track which is the time, okay? Because if it is a long time ago, like you know, two years ago you know, of the last you know, fair login, I might want to just go like, okay, you know, we, we don't count that, okay? And on the, on, on the other hand, you know, once we have a successful login, we might want to reset this one too. Does that make any sense? Okay. So now we have to learn how to unset, how, how do we remove a particular session variable, which obviously I cannot remember. So we look at, hmm? Okay, so we, we should look it up. <laughs> okay. So it does have, you know, session unset, free all session variables, and it has unset a particular one, unset only product index in this one, so I'm gonna read it just to be sure. Okay. But this is user feedback. There's another way to make unset work with session variables from within a function. Uh, okay, looks like that will work, but I'm not convinced. Free all. We don't want to free all. But we might find something that we want here. Okay, so we want, we go to the right hand side and then we look at the index of other functions. So we got commit, destroy, okay, that might be something we want to look into. ID is registered. The registration whole thing you know, is not use, used anymore. So we have reset, okay, start status, un okay, we have that. So unset is not what we want, because if you call unset, it will free all session variables currently registered. We don't want to do that. We just want to get rid of one. So session destroy, destroy all data registered to a session, not what we want. Reset is going to reinitialize session array with original values, which means it is kind of the same thing as uh, session start except it doesn't do the reinterpretation of the cookies anymore. It is just going to go like, okay, retrieve all the session variables related to this particular session ID, okay? So it, it, that's not what we want. And the last one is unregister, and this unregisters a particular one, but it has been deprecated already, and it is already removed. So that doesn't work. So that means unset session, blah, 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 is what we need. <coughs> So going back to this code, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and say, if we do log in successfully and is set <clears throat> session uh, num 
failed login, then we'll unset it. I can. I don't think you can call unset even when there's no such variable without generating a warning. So that's why I check whether it is already set before I unset it. Is that okay? Does everybody does everybody understand why I'm guarding the unset with a is set when somebody logged in successfully? Okay, cool. All right. And of course, we can also send a confirmation. When we say confirmation, sign in successful, okay. just as a feedback. So with wrong password, we're going to do this. We are going to increment the uh, failed login. And But if you're just counting, it's not going to do any good. So you're going to have to um, check how many times you know, this person or this email address has failed to log in. And at a certain number, within a certain time frame, you might need an additional flag in the table to say, lock it out. Okay, this is not going to work anymore. Now, this approach will only work if all the sign in is coming from the same session. All the all the hack attempts are from from the same session. In other words, you know, a hacker is using a particular computer or virtual machine to repeatedly try to log into a certain account using a dictionary attack tactic, okay? But hackers don't work that way. Hackers use a, what we call a botnet, you know, that can have thousands to, uh, to millions of computers in order to try to hack into accounts. In other words, this approach cannot stop a hacker who is using a botnet to try to brute force its way into uh, logging into a single account. Because they are all coming from different computers, which means they store different cookies, which also means from the PHP perspective, they're all different sessions. So counting the number of failed login of a particular session is not going to work. Yep, go ahead. Would it be viable to um, run a botnet off of several uh, virtual computers? Yep. OK. <laughs> You, you, you can you can spin off you know additional you know uh, what they call instances on AWS and only pay for you know the instances that you you, you spin up and to do something like this you know to once you identify what website you know somebody wants to hack into to start up a virtual <coughs> machine that is capable of pretending to be a client and send in the, the request and stuff like that takes minimal resources we are talking about probably 256 megabytes of RAM, one single processor, maybe two gigs of hard drive space or something like that, which is totally inexpensive, right? Yeah, you could have, you could have so you have a bunch of uh, small virtual machines running on a server pretending to be dozens, uh, or if not hundreds of clients. Yep, but they will come from the same family of IP addresses, which is also what you know, Wells Fargo may use to block <coughs> you. Well, you could just IP run addresses. all those through proxies somehow. Yep. So, <laughs> but, a bit slower, though. but the bottom line is, this approach does not well, can stop certain dictionary attack attempts, but not all. Okay, because if the if the attack is coming from different sessions on different machines, this cannot do the counting anymore. Okay, so I just want to kind of point out things that are related to sessions, but also related to security. Okay. So what, if, what do you want to do if you say, OK, I know hackers can come in from different machines in different sessions. How do you protect your server? Instead of using session variables, what are you going to use? Starts with a D. Database. Extend your user's table to include a counter for failed login, a timestamp of the last failed login or the first failed login, okay? You know, so you can actually measure the time and say, okay, within five minutes, okay? I don't care from how many different IP addresses, but within five minutes, we have 600 failed logins associated with this email address. Something is definitely fishy, right? On the other hand, if you say, oh, it's coming from the same IP address within a year, okay? Somebody failed to log in, three times. It, it 
it's probably the person forgetting the password or mistyping something on the keyboard. It's okay, okay, we're not gonna bother this person. Is that making any sense? So that's, you know, so this is telling you the difference between tracking something using session variables as opposed to tracking something using a database entry, okay? Because the database entry doesn't matter which session is coming from, what IP address, everything goes into the same table in the database. Sessions, on the other hand, are only specific to a single instance of a browser, which means if you set up your Firefox to run multiple profiles, they are all running different sessions. And that's one single browser on a single computer. And you can maintain multiple profiles, which also means it is multiple sessions. So that's why you know, there are only so many things you want to do with session variables. And most other things that you want to be really persistent, you want to store in the database. Are we doing OK so far with that concept? OK, excellent. But you know, this gives you an idea of what we can do here. Um, on the other hand, if, it is, you know, if, it, if the email does not really match anyone in the user table, well, that's probably nothing you can do, okay? Because you know, there's, there's nowhere to store this, right? No place to put it. So there's nothing to store. But in both cases, you want to uh, leave a message just so that the end user knows you know, it has failed. So in this case, we're going to put it here and just say uh, confirmation is failed login. <clears throat> it's going to be the same message, the very, very same message when the email does not exist. You do not want to use a different message. Okay. And did I put out the message? Nope. Oh, I do. Okay, so it's, it's the last thing, but it does get printed out. Okay. So let's try it. So where is my page? Right here, that's my session. So we go to login1.php, tag arccis.net, and we'll give it the wrong password. Submit query, fail login, and then we'll say tag at arccis.net, and we'll give it the right password, asdf, submit query, A, hey, it's still fail login. Was it ASDF? I think it was. Yeah. I thought it was. Okay, so for debugging purposes, for debugging purposes, and only for debugging purposes, yeah. I'm going to make a difference <laughs> here. Okay, one has an exclamation point, the other one does not. ASDF. Okay, maybe I just had a typo. Maybe. <laughs> okay, but, but now we have a session open, okay? In other words, the session variable called ID now has a value of my actual user ID in the table, which is just an integer, which is important because from here on, as long as I try to use the same browser and the same session, I have just identified myself. I don't have to re-identify myself time after time anymore. I can now rely on the ID session variable to say that, okay, every, everything that we now do is related to tag. Okay? When I say, okay, check my grade, it's going to be my grade. Okay? Then we say, okay, see what is in my, in, in my shopping cart. It's my shopping cart. And when I say pay, it's going to be my credit card. <laughs> so are we still do okay like all, all, with all the stuff here. What if I gonna? What if I tell you this is all kind of outdated stuff, and there's really no need to maintain authentication like this using your own code anymore. You guy goes like. You mean we just wasted like two, three hours talking about stuff that is not useful anymore? And I would say, well, the concept is important, but the implementation is not, this is not a good way to do it, okay? For many reasons. 
First one is the liability is yours. This is your PHP code, this is your website, it is your database maintaining the password and whatnot. Okay, so that's not a very good thing to do. Second thing is some users may decide to use a different password on different websites, right? You know, just to be either secure or they forgot and they wanted to use a different password for whatever reason. Now they have to maintain you know, different passwords for different sites. Even though it's still using email address, it is not a very good way to go. So what I want to do is to point out products that can help you with this. One is called Firebase from Google, and I want to look into the authentication part of it. So Firebase authentication, easy, secure login, and you can use it on your own website too. So what this is, is basically you're deferring authentication to Google. Okay, um, I'm sure some of you have seen you know, have, uh, I mean websites like that where you try to sign in and it, and it says, you know, oh, you can use Google sign in. If you already have a Google identity, you can use Google sign in. <laughs> yep, and it's really getting more and more common these days because it is a single sign in. You don't have to create new passwords and new usernames for every single website. I'm trying to remember which one it is. Quora. Okay, that's it. So first of all, I want to remove all the Quora uh, cookies here so that we so so that it will be prompted. O Q U O R A. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to remove all of these. Remove, select it. There we go. So I go to Quora.com. Okay. And it says right here, I have three ways to sign in. I can sign in with my Google identity, I can sign in with my Facebook identity, or if I choose to, I can have my own you know, login account that is created based on what, I, what we just said, the email address and a separate password. So with Google sign in, it's really cool because I can now sign in. There's nothing I do on Quora that I cannot display in the class. So that's cool. So I'm gonna sign in with my account here. Now of course whenever I type the password, something is always kind of gnawing in the back of my mind is, is did someone install the key logger on this computer? Does you, do you guys know what is a key logger? Yes, it's yes? The Yep. Well, it still it, it logs keys. <laughs> <laughs> if you turn out to type path to be typing password, yes, it will log the passwords too. I know for sure there's no software key logger because this is my distribution and my operating system. Okay, it is not the one installed by the school, so the, even the school cannot spy on me. Well, not easily. Okay, so I just signed in using my Google identity. And now, you know, I sign in as myself, okay? I can see my picture over here. That's me. Yep. The problem with signing with Google is now Google knows what you're doing. Um, no, that is not entirely true. Really? Because, so what happens is Google knows that I signed into Quora. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, I don't know, like that's not always a problem, but if you're trying to be like sneaky about something, it's a problem. Well, or if you just want to maintain your privacy, that can be an issue too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but but it's a mechanism. This particular mechanism is off, is also available to you. You know because you know you can utilize this code or, or the the code to do it. So if you go to Firebase, you know using Firebase authentication, they give you um, implementation in iOS for mobile devices. You know Apple mobile devices. Um, in Android, if you use Android mobile devices and you want to click on web and it gives you Google sign in when you click it it would it, it will give you the actual code that you need and the code interesting interestingly is not in PHP it is in JavaScript so all of this is done in JavaScript it is not done in PHP but what JavaScript is going to do is to send your server a token once the sign in is successful. Go ahead, sorry. I was just curious, what's in it for uh, Google to do all this? 
by them. Well, as as you said, you know, now Google can track you because they they, they know that you just signed into Quora. Okay. Well, also like reputation-wise, Google is known for um, like really wanting to a lot a lot of the most modern advancements we have is thanks to Google engineering. So it's mo uh, they claim it's all for the progress of computer science. Um, as to whether or not I trust them, well, I guess I trust them about as much well, as I trust anyone. to make money, so uh, This is why they they want you to use a Firebase authentication. Um, so Firebase is not just about authentication. Firebase yeah. is also about the database. <coughs> now, this is another big topic. We, we, we talked about the after class last week, but I want to kind of repeat that to the whole class. So the database in Firebase is not relational. Okay, remember RDB, RDBS, RDBMS. RDBMS, okay, relational database management system, okay. The R part is almost outdated now, okay. Relation, relational databases is really cool because now you have one table, you have another table, and you can say, oh, this table and this table are related by a join operation, then you can use the where to specify whether it's an inner join, left join, left join, right join, left join, or outer join, right? So that's the power of a relational database. But the problem with a relational database is when you have these tables you know, and to do the join operation, it cannot be parallelized when you have a cluster of computers. In other words, throwing a hundred servers at a problem doesn't help, or doesn't help a you know, hundred folds, okay? Um, when your database is big, it also has a big problem. Relational databases store data in a particular way that doesn't really scale very well when your database is beyond eight gigabytes large. Okay, now that threshold may be increased a little bit, but then nonetheless, it is not very friendly when you have a lot of data to store. It also is not friendly when your data does not have the fixed width, it's not well formatted. Some entries are huge, some entries are tiny, other entries are somewhere in between. Relato relational databases cannot deal with that very efficiently. Okay, so with Firebase, it has a component of database, okay, real-time database. This is their component, and this is this one is a good entry point to start to understand what it, what big data is about, okay, which is surprisingly simple, okay. If you think about you know um, uh, any type of big data database. It is a folder. It's based on the concept of a file folder system. Okay, it, they call it with a, with a different name. Okay, the name that they use is a key value pair tree. Okay, basically that's what it is. But it, you can just remember it as file systems. Okay, the best way to look at it. Okay, this is even better. Uh, you just go to any file manager, and you can immediately see what it is about, because at the root, you just have, you know, this is your the entire database. Your entire, entire da database has a root. Everything under this root is called a key value pair. What key are we talking about? What pair are we, what, what, what value are we talking about? This is the key. Home is a key. Media is a, is a key. Uh, VM Linux is a key. VM Linux Ode is a key, and so on. So each entry is, is a key, which is a name that has to be unique at that level. It's a key value pair. What is the value? Well, home as a value is a tree. It has its own key value pair under it, okay? What about VM Linux? VM Linux is not a folder, so the value is equivalent to the actual content of that file. VM Linux is the name of the file, the file has its content, which is its own value. So big data is really about this. Okay, everything is organized just like this. Except the names or the keys are always indexed. In other words, given a folder, quote unquote folder, with millions and millions of entries, locating one particular item is fast. And it scales with clustering, which means if you throw if you throw 10 computers at this problem, it will run at a certain speed. 
if you throw a hundred computers at this at the same problem, it run it run ten times as fast. If you throw a thousand computers, it will be a hundred times faster as fast as ten computers. And also the data is spread out. Okay, it is automatically uh, resilient to having one computer shutting down. Okay, because all the data is duplicated. It's using clustering technology. So that's big data, which is conceptually very simple. But the difficult part is people who are used to relational database, they have to use a baseball bat to hit themselves a few times first. Because everything that you learn about relational database, all the best practice of <laughs> relational database becomes worst practice in big data. Well, it's like going <laughs> back in history, right? It is and going. This is how databases used to be, and the relational database solved those problems. Yep. And now, because uh, the storage and all those things have become cheap, so now what was bad 30 years ago is good. Well, relational database, relational database is the way it is because storage was expensive. Right. And, and everything was on a single server. Access, access and data was also really complicated because see, Mm -hmm. Before that, they used to be higher to come on it, like IMS. Mm -hmm. And then people were having problems using that database, and this is why they said, okay, we need something better. Yep. And move to this one. Yep. Question? Yep. Oh, you're mm -hmm. scratching? Okay, cool. Um, the other thing that you might want to look into when you have time, not probably not this semester, but this is something that you might want to look into is Firebase also includes your cloud messaging. Which basically means you know it is easy to send messages to users that have been registered to you to, to your website. Okay, you don't need a server to run these scripts. So these scripts are called you know serverless, which means you are not going to run it on your own server. You just specify the code, you upload it to the cloud, you upload it to Google, and you know code just runs. Okay, um, authentication we talked about already. Uh, this is the unified authentication piece or platform, and they have just extended, of you know, extended what you can use for authentication purposes. So just by looking at the Google, uh, the the the, um, the logos, you can log in using Google identity, Facebook identity, Twitter identity. This is a GitHub identity for developers. Um, this one I cannot really. I think this is messaging, and this is phone number. Okay, so it's allowing a whole bunch of ways for people to sign in to authenticate, and they all kind of go into the same database. Um, each identity is guaranteed to have a unique ID, but it's going to be the same unique ID. So if you run a website and you let people sign into your website, and run the website to people that sign into my website, the same email address will have the same identi that identical ID across multiple websites using the same authentication mechanism. So this is kind of big, and this is where people are migrating to, is not to maintain your own authentication mechanism anymore, and deferring that to Google or Facebook or some other you know, places that basically a lot of people have accounts in, on. Yeah, it solves two problems. One, everyone wants to sign on. Mm -hmm. So it's going in that direction, and then also yep. uh, there's less liability you for you as a Web browser or the website with it. They say, oh, they just took it from Google. So yep. Google's now, single, single sign in is really, really attractive, but it has one potential problem. Because if people can hack into your account, they can now potentially hack into every single other account that uses the same ID. So if you are moving to utilize you know, single sign in using Google Identity, one thing you definitely want to look into, now this is also kind of beyond what we do in this class, but you know, this is something that you might want to look into, is to look into two-factor authentication. Um, it, it has a specific meaning for RSA, it has a general meaning when you go to Wikipedia, but the idea is you're not only relying on your password to establish who you are. So let's say I'm just trying to sign into Amazon, okay? So I sign to Amazon, I give Amazon my ID and also my password. But if I specify that I also want two-factor authentication, Amazon is going to send me a text on my phone. Okay, Whatever phone I register with your Amazon, and it will give me a code 
five digit, six digit, something like that, okay? So on the web page, I will have to type in that your know, number in order to sign in. So this means if somebody actually stole my password, okay, that person can enter my password. But unless that person also has my cell phone to receive that text from Amazon, that other person cannot really sign in. So this is called two-factor sign-in because the second factor is whatever site you're trying to sign in will send you something, but not using the same medium as what you use to try to sign in. So this is a second medium to give you a code where you enter using the first medium so that you can establish your identity. Now, if somebody you know, had both my Amazon password, my Amazon identity, and my cell phone, guess what? That person can now buy stuff you know, out of my expense. <laughs> but there are easier ways, right? You know, somebody with a knife or a gun can just say, OK, I want you to order something for me. <laughs> Take me to the bank. OK, you cannot stop everything. OK, it's just that you know, the automated ones here, you, know, you want to stop. Yep. So like on Verizon, I would be entering a user ID. They ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. So is that those two factor? Uh, what is that other question? What is the first name of your best friend? So that would be a security question, which okay. I would not really consider a two factor you know, authentication. A true two factor authentication means the second factor cannot be going through the same medium okay. that you were using to sign in in the first place. It has to be using a different medium. The RSA two-factor authentication is a different, is actually a physical device. I mean, some of you might have seen that. So it's a second device that looks about the same size as a credit card. It has a clock on it. And depending on, I think every five minutes, it refreshes to have a different number. It's not internet connected, it's not 4G connected, it's not Wi-Fi connected in any way. It is just fully autonomous by itself. So with that, you basically have to enter your RSA card ID and register that with Amazon. So once Amazon knows you know, which RSA card you have, it knows whether to, how to match the number that you enter based on time. And that time rotates every five minutes in a way that it is, un it is nearly impossible to predict what is going to be the next number. So somebody can be looking over your shoulder. That person may grab that you know, number, but it's only going to be useful for the next five minutes. After five minutes, the number refreshes. So that's truly you know, two-factor authentication that is not dependent on any consumer you know, great product, but this is actually expensive. <laughs> this is expensive stuff. Um, and also there's that the whole story of the RSA and the NSA thing. Do you guys remember that? Okay, well this is why when I teach this class it's a little bit different. Okay, so if you, if you look up RSA and NSA, you know, the first thing that pops up is NSA infiltrated RSA security more deeply than thought. Now, it is three years back, okay, you know, three years ago. So basically, the NSA, which is the National Security Agency, um, went to RSA, which is a company. RSA are the uh, initial of the last names of three people, okay, um, which is a, a private company. They make security devices. So the NSA you know, went in and say, um, the key generation algorithm, why don't you guys use this one? The one that they gave to RSA or they recommended RSA to use is weak, okay? To the point so that RSA, uh, NSA, sorry, so that NSA, the National Security Agency, can easily hack into content that is RSA encryption encrypted. So the idea is the National Security Agency would have a back door to encrypted traffic. Now, why is that a bad thing? Yep? Well, I didn't already say anything. Um, there's also money exchanged. Oh. <laughs> yep. Well, there is a story just recently that an NSA is true that stolen, the tools that they were using, the 
Russia or something like that? Oh yeah, antivirus programs, right? Yep. Yep, go ahead. Well, that's what I was saying. Yep, day. go ahead. Yep, Summer Wars is interesting. Okay, so I'm I'm I know many of you are not anime fans. I am, um, but you might want to watch this with your uh, kid. Okay, if your kid is you know still in that age, or grandkids if you have grandkids of that age. The the interesting part of Summer Wars is it combines several things that we are currently at the verge of getting into. Okay, the first one is AI. Um, I don't know how many of you are keeping track of AI or the progress of AI. If you're not, you might want to look up Sophia and Hansen. <clears throat> and uh, this is one thing that's kind of interesting because uh, Hansen, uh, the Sophia AI robot, which is mostly the software part that I think is interesting, is um, it, it's intelligent. Okay, uh, Watson from IBM is intelligent. Okay, so we are pretty much at the point where um, artificial intelligence is practical, okay? It's no longer pie in the sky, okay? It is actually practical, and computers, we, they found that AI can create their own language, it can create its own religion, and it can come up with solutions to solve problems that we do not think that an AI would be able to come up with, okay? So that's one thing. <coughs> Yeah, I've watched, uh, I think it was one of the AIs produced uh, by them, um, or something competing, uh, actually wind up in an existential crisis when questioned about its faith. Mm -hmm. um, and just for uh, you know, entertainment purposes, look up Watson and Urban Dictionary. Okay, I'm not going to read those articles, you know, this is a good summary. Um, so the Urban Dictionary was exposed to Watson, which is capable of learning. So after Watson was exposed, it picked up bad languages from the Urban Dictionary. And when, the, when its creator or when its you know, developer asked it some questions, um, Watson replied with, bullshit. <laughs> and in the right context too, but it picked up the, the foul language because of the exposure to Urban Dictionary, okay? Now, why do, why do you think, why do, why do I think this particular anime is kind of interesting? Um, it combined the concept of single sign-in with AI. So the storyline, you know, being a Japanese anime, it's basically the storyline is the United States Air Force was secretly developing an AI you know, that can be used as an attack to attack other websites, but it got out in the wild. So one of the first, first things that it did was to attack social media websites. Because a lot of times, social media websites are not really secure. People do not think, you know, hey, there's nothing important here. Except the single sign-in you know, mechanism also rests on multimedia websites, like Facebook, right? So what happened was the AI was able to get the sign-in the sign password and the authentic authentication information of many important individuals. So it started off with controlling traffic, okay? And then, you know, flight, you know, uh, traffic. And then eventually it was able to control a lot of stuff, okay? Um, and then the main characters, uh, these are the avatars of the main characters. You know, these are the online, you know, appearances of the, of the characters. They're basically teenagers. So a bunch of teenagers discovered this problem and they were trying to, they were fighting the AI. And then the AI thought, Okay, hmm, I don't really like these people trying to you know, foil my plans. And what it ended up doing was to gain um, orbital control of satellites, to crash satellites onto <laughs> the place where the kids are residing. Now, obviously, this is science fiction. It is anime. It is targeting 14-year-olds like myself. Um, <laughs> but the premise of the storyline actually makes sense, okay? As creepy as it seems, it actually makes sense. Yep. 
the uh, the writers of Summer War were actually very heavily involved in the computer industry before they became uh, animators. Oh, um, okay. There's actually, and because the uh, anime development community in Japan is so incestuous in that Japan is a country smaller than California, um, a lot of times uh, there's a, actually a lot of directors that um, take their history in computers, which is a lot more rich of an education of commonly in there, and apply it to their passion for animation, especially because computers and animation often intersect as a medium in the first place. And also, um, I'm pretty sure the Funimation website that you're on right now should be able to show some rewards to people for free. Or yep. you can get a, um, a temporary subscription. I think it's free from here. Yeah, because uh, summer I found the summer wars is it's really old, so it's really easy to get online legally now. True. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go ahead. I just want to tell you I'm not going to be here next Thursday. Okay. So I will. Will still be streaming. Still, okay. Yep. You know another interesting thing about summer wars is that um, it uh, the original concept of it came from when the staff uh, at the studio had worked on a small, uh, on a shorter Digimon promotional movie. Right, right, I, know, um, I, I remember Digimon from yeah. way back. They yep. had a, a movie that had come out in Japan called Boku no War Game, or Our War Game, um, where uh, it was basically like a shorter, more condensed version of Summer Wars with different characters. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to expand on the idea and use their own characters, so they mm -hmm. basically took our war game and made summer wars out of the like blueprint that it mm -hmm. laid out but we never got the actual version of our war game in the states we mm -hmm. got a version of it called digimon the movie which actually combined like five different digimon movies into a longer one that made no sense <laughs> but no, well, like, but it's it, but it's for yeah. for American you know, consumption. So yeah, it's okay. we had to put a bunch of punk rock in it and poop jokes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, but this is another really good movie that I oh, think yeah, is. No. I've watched the uh, the television series of Ghost in the Shell. I've watched the, the movies. I've watched the original movie, an animated movies, and I have the a live action. I have a review of the live action one on my YouTube channel mm. and why it's just a complete failure of a film. <laughs> well, I love I love the original, but the live action one is a failure. For entertainment purposes, it's okay, you know. It's I mean, I know a lot of people that came out of it excited, but I just felt like it did so little to actually scratch the surface of the of what Ghost in the Shell was actually about. True. Well, a lot of stuff in Ghost in the Shell is difficult to do with uh, live action, like all the cyber you know exploration, all the cyber diving. It's really hard to kind of use live action to show. I just felt like it, Ghost in the Shell was about, first and foremost, transhumanism. And, like, the live action movie kind of came off to me as transhumanism for dummies. It's not even human, you know, because when you look into, uh, what, did, what, did, what is the name of those you know, spider-like robots in uh, Tachikoma. Ghost Tachikoma. Tachikoma. Tachi... Uh, K-O-M-A. I really like uh, the... The sideline, you know, of the Tachikoma, because they eventually sacrificed themselves. Yeah, that was to beautiful. Save people, <laughs> and I almost cried. I know, me too. I think I did cry. <laughs> when soldiers die in the battlefield, I go like, "Oh, that is admirable." But these guys, you know, decided of their own free will. They decided they had free will, yeah. and then to use it to sacrifice themselves. Yeah, so that was. I think that was a super duper, you know, plot. Yeah. Of, uh, of Ghost in the Shell, and I think that really is the big, the biggest thing because um, originally they are only talking about people who were biological, but step by step, gradually they, they became cybernetic. So they still had a root that was biological. Yeah. But Tachikomas are completely artificial to begin with. Yeah. And also, I think in the in the first gig or the second gig, I cannot remember which one, but the the consciousness. You know, just simultaneously comes into existence just because you know, of the sheer amount of information collected on the, in the net. Yeah, because they're like a lot. Because they're allowed to communicate <clears throat> with not only each other but also relay it back and forth from the internet. Yep. So th in a way, they made themselves more intelligent by just communicating with each other, and which was a type of networking. Yep. Um, but yeah, like. Uh, but it's like I felt like Motoko's storyline focused on the idea of defining what is 
and isn't human and if we are actually capable of engineering the humanity out of ourselves mm -hmm. um, and I felt like the uh, movie uh, the live action movie wanted to focus on um, on that aspect of Motoko but they dumbed it down to the point where it's not even really sufficient for explaining the point um, and if you really want to hear me rant about that with like two other guys for like 47 minutes, I, ha I have a YouTube video on my channel you can check you can out. Send, send it to me. I'll, I'm interested. All right. It's um, great. And if, you, and if you like it, you can uh, yeah. subscribe to my channel. I normally talk about um, Japanese um, like live action special effects cinema like tokusatsu, your Ultraman, your Godzilla, mm -hmm. your Kamen Rider. Those but, are uh, those I, are cool too, but they're not as um, you know. In, in terms of you know, the future that we're stepping into, you know, I think you know, uh, Alan Turing is one. Um, oh yeah, Alan Turing is a, a story. He has a, a, a whole you know history to him that I have a great deal of empathy for, considering how I I really feel like. Uh, the com that uh, computer technology and the LGBTQ community are actually very connected um, because of how many of us ended up going into uh, jobs like that. And I don't know. There's I a have reason a too. I have a lot of empathy for him, considering that you know he was castrated mm -hmm. for how chemically castrated. Yeah. Yep. So the uh, so the other ones you know that are really interested you know along this line you know one is Isaac Asimov. Oh yeah. Who basically talked about the morality of robots, um, you know what we teach the robots and what robots can and cannot do. Well, um, uh, they, Sh Shotaro Ishinomori, who created um, Kamen Rider, Kikaider, Go Ranger, uh, stuff like that. Um, also, uh, like to he definitely got inspiration from Isaac Asimov, mm -hmm. um, and he was also an apprentice to uh, Osamu Tezuka of Astro Boy fame, who mm -hmm. which like they actually use the laws of robotics as a plot point in Astro mm -hmm. Boy. Yep, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But I really like the uh, Isaac Asimov storylines where you know a robot basically got into a coma because he had to make a decision. If I were to save this person, I would have to sacrifice that person, and vice versa. And they couldn't just, it, it just deadlocked. It's like, wow. okay, I can't do a single thing about this. <laughs> wow. Because, because it's <laughs> not about sacrificing itself to save someone, which is okay. I'm a robot, I'm expandable, yes, woohoo! You know, I, I'd like to die with honor. It's about, I can save this person, I can save A, but then I will have to kill B. Or I can save B, but then I have to kill A. And that caused the robot to deadlock. It's like, I can't decide. I, I cannot evaluate you know, who I can sacrifice and who I cannot sacrifice. So that's a good one. 2001, obviously, is a classic, too, yeah. with HAL uh, 9000, you know, which is actually not a psychotic computer. It is the programming that was erroneous that caused the, the, the robot yeah. seem, uh, the it AI to seem to It was just following its instructions, but its yep. instructions were flawed. Conflicting. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it got conflicting information. Now, Alan Turing is very interesting in this whole, whole setup, you know, not only because that he was, you know, homosexual and at the time, you know, they were persecuted by the government and, you know, and they, they, they were doing awful things to, uh, to people that they do, do not understand, but also the fact that he was, um, he was trying to resurrect his friend, Christopher. Yeah, really? With computers. Okay, they don't tell you about that very No, no, often. it was in the story, it was in the movie. Yeah, okay, I, ne I never saw, I never saw the movies about him or anything. I just oh, remember, okay. I just remember being briefly touched upon in, um, what was his name, Lestrange's class. Okay, so you want, this is, this is really interesting because when you look up Alan Turing, Christopher, um, he named the computer Christopher, but also at the same time, when at, at least according to the movie, when he died, when he committed suicide, he was still working on the computer, and he he was given two choices: he can lose funding to his research, or he can volunteer to uh, be chemically castrated, but they but they will keep his funding. So he chose to take the medicine to keep the funding so that he can keep working on the computer, which he was hoping uh, the computer can recreate his childhood you know, friend, you know, Christopher. 
So that is the whole idea. That that's the original AI. You know, he he didn't do it. You know, they they didn't have the the necessary hardware to do it. But it was the first attempt, or one of the first attempts. Um, but now we can we actually did it. You know, if you look up uh, Sophia, it's creepy. Oh yeah, I yeah for sure. Have you seen her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's she's really creepy, and so is Han, you know, the older brother, you know, who said you know I'm gonna take over the world, and you cannot really unplug me once I. You know, download myself onto the web, and I have my own drone army. You cannot stop me. Any, you cannot stop me anymore. See, that's that's what I want to eventually <laughs> aspire to live for. I, I, I when, when I, as soon as I graduate, once I graduate from this, you know, <laughs> also I'll walk up the business. I'll start my own company. I'll, I'll or I'll uh, hijack Google or something. I'll become an AI and I'll live on the internet. I am just gonna <laughs> build a big beacon to send out to outer space and say, Borg, come and pick me up. <laughs> see, either either I want to escape into the internet, um, and I can definitely see we relate on that escapism thing, um, but also uh, the idea of just being like, yep, I'm done with this earth. Don't want.